This happened back in 2007. We were both women in our early 20s and sharing an apartment in a major metro area. Not a small town, but not a big city either. Through the short stretch of wood behind our apartment complex, there was a neighborhood of single family homes. Typical suburban cul-de-sac American middle class neighborhood. Except that this neighborhood was completely unoccupied. Like I said, it was around 2007. So the effects of the American recession were still in full swing. A developer had brought the neighborhood and all the houses to tear down. They had built a nice shiny new street from the main road to the neighborhood, but money probably ran out before the homes could be bulldozed. At least that's my best guess, as there were several stalled construction projects in the area that had met the same fate. There was nothing in the immediate area in the way of shops, stores or gas stations, just empty residential homes. A bit eerie, but nothing overtly creepy. Being young, adventurous and having some daytime hours free due to our retail jobs, my bestie and I liked to go on walks in this abandoned neighborhood. There was a short path through some woods and then you came out into the main neighborhood street, which started out gravel and turned into asphalt towards the nicer end of the neighborhood with the bigger, newer houses. We'd walk up and down, chatting and maybe surreptitiously hitting a joint, just being young and carefree. One of the homes looked to have a few acres of land and there was a big field where we'd take blankets and go lay in sometimes. So on the day that this encounter took place, the sun was shining and there was a brilliant blue sky. It was probably late summer or early fall. I can't remember which exactly, AKA broad daylight. Like I said earlier, the neighborhood was a bit hairy, but on that day we felt pretty safe. We were on one of our midday abandoned neighborhood strolls when we see a car on the street heading in our direction. This wasn't the first time we'd seen a vehicle there. It was a small blue hatchback. I don't know cars very well, so that was the most specific description I could come up with. Neither of us got a good look at the driver's face, but we see that there are two people in the car. All I can make out is that the driver is male, white, and has brown hair, wearing a blue and white raglan t-shirt. The car rumbles past us on the gravel road and out of sight. And we continue on, thinking it was odd, but not that odd. A few minutes later, the car comes back from the direction it came, passing us from behind. It dries out of sight over this little hill, and we figure maybe they got turned around since there's obviously nothing of interest on this road, except this abandoned subdivision. We continue walking for a few minutes until we reach a little hill. And as we get to the top, we see the car that just drove past us. The car was stopped on the road a little way ahead of us, just sitting there with its brake lights on. That's when I notice the person in the passenger seat has gone. And I find this odd and start internally questioning whether I even saw the passenger at all until my friend says, wasn't there another person? My hackles start to go up and I'm creeped out at this point. Something about the way that car was just sitting there idling, like they were waiting for us. There's nothing of interest behind us where they could have dropped the passenger off, which makes their absence very unsettling. I don't know how long we were standing there staring at this car, possibly with the driver's accomplice having been dropped off behind us and the car in front of us lying in wait, but it felt like forever. I had a cold, heavy feeling in my stomach. My friend and I are both frozen to the spot, hair on the back of our neck standing up, mental alarm bells ringing. It's dawning on me that no one knows where I am. While I'm standing there, frozen in fear, brain frantically trying to figure out how long it will be until my boyfriend would get off work and discover us missing. The car started backing up towards us fast. As it accelerates backwards towards us, my friend and I come to our senses and tear off towards the woods, cutting through the backyard of one of the abandoned houses. We frantically bushwhack our way through the short stretch of wood and come out on the opposite side of our apartment complex and run like hell until we reach our building. I have no idea what that driver was doing 
what their intentions were, or where his passenger disappeared to. But either way, creepy driver, let's not meet. I've been a firefighter slash EMT for a few years now. In my first year, my partner and I got dispatched to a fall. Two kids fresh out of high school were out hiking and decided to climb a rock face. One of them fell and was impaled by the tree stump. I remember getting to where he was and his whole body was trembling uncontrollably. I went to work trying to stop the bleeding as a pool of blood had already formed around the stump while my partner called dispatch to get a helivac. The kid looked at me and just stuttered out, Am I gonna die? I told him I was doing everything I could and that I needed to keep him talking. He didn't say anything for 30 seconds after that. When he finally did say something it was, I don't wanna die. This was a kid within a year or two of my age and he was depending on me and my partner to keep him alive. That was a moment where I was wondering what the hell I was doing in this profession, and if this was something I wanted to continue doing. The kid didn't make it. Helivac wasn't available, and even if it was, he would have bled out before it got there. I ended up in counseling from that call, but I'm still here doing the same job, and I love it. In my childhood home, there were always weird things that happened. Bumps in the night, pots and pans clanking, floors moaning. Around the age of 10 or so, things started to get worse. Our living room and dining room were connected. They were basically one giant room. The dining room had a push button dimmer light. It had to be physically pushed in for the light to come on and it made a distinct click when it was pushed. My stepmother was out on a business trip, so it was me, my sister, and my father all watching TV in the living room with our backs to the dining room, when all of a sudden, the button makes the click noise and the light turns on. We all look at each other in disbelief, more specifically, my sister and I. My father seemed more curious than anything, I specifically remember feeling sick to my stomach after it happening. Something just didn't feel right. I could see in my sister's eyes that it didn't feel right with her either. My father investigated it and chalked it up to some electrical malfunction, but my sister and I both heard the click of the button. Things began to get weirder after that. There would be a good bit of time in between things, but they continued to happen for a few years. Sometimes before I fell asleep, a shadowy figure would come into my room. Sometimes I would see it in the corner, sometimes at the foot of my bed, and other times it would be next to me. I never feared it, and I never told anyone, because who would believe it? Eventually it progressed. I would wake up and see it in the corner of the room, on the ceiling, and it started to become more distinct. It was missing a chunk of its head and its eyes were black. Its nose looked like what you'd see for someone whose face was decayed, and its mouth was black. Now I became more intrigued as to who and why, but I didn't pay it any attention. It started to wake me up in the middle of the night. It would never hurt me or anything, but I still don't sleep with my feet out from under the covers, and it's been 15 years. It would show up next to me and just be there for a minute. I would look up and back at it and eventually it would go away. Eventually it started getting on the bed. It would wake me up and be right in front of my face and I mean directly in front, looking at me with its mouth or lack thereof and its black holes for eyes staring into me. I'd close my eyes for a second and open them, and it would still be there. For some reason, I refused to move at all when it all happened. I'd remain very still and would just let it pass. It wasn't like I was paralyzed or anything, but my curiosity wanted to see what it would do. And every time it would wake me up and be at my face, 
and it would eventually just disappear into the dark. As time went on, I began waking up with scratches on my stomach, my back and my legs. I knew it couldn't have been me scratching myself because I chew my nails to the point where there are none. Always have. It was always three scratch marks. The worst one went from my right shoulder across my chest and down my left hip diagonally across my body. The last time that I saw it, I woke up and it was at the side of my bed and this time it appeared bigger, taller. It stood there for a second this time and I physically couldn't move. My legs and arms felt like they were a thousand pounds apiece. The figure then started to lean over the bed and it began to disappear into my body. The whole thing took a few seconds and it was all over and never happened again after that. Eight years later, it's Christmas time and the whole family is at my sister's house. We all have a few drinks and start talking about old times. The subject comes up about my parents' old house being haunted. Naturally, my parents are poking fun at me and my sister for discussing the different weird things that happened there. Now, like I said, I'd never told anyone about the figure, because who would believe me, right? Then my sister says, and the figure that would come in the night, the face? I interrupted her and said, the one with the blacked out eyes and mouth and no nose. She looks at me in disbelief and says, oh my God, yes, that one. We had discussed it for a little bit and then moved on. I think the creepiest part is the validation of such a weird childhood memory. My family live a state away from me. And at the time that this happened, I had just turned 18. I'm a 21 year old female and my mom would finally let me drive to go see them, which was about a five and a half hour drive. No biggie. I was like, and I can smoke some weed on the drive that easy. And I did just that. About halfway there, I needed to stop and get gas and snacks. As you can guess, I had the munchies. I wasn't very familiar with the drive or where the gas stations were on it and they were kind of spread out. So as soon as I felt it wasn't smart to wait until another gas station came up, I pulled off the highway. I have always been sort of suspicious of people in general because I've not had an easy childhood and grew up learning to just kind of feel when things aren't right. So I wasn't really worried about being by myself because I knew how to handle myself. So I pull up to this relatively empty gas station, maybe with one or two other cars but it was a larger one with one of those antique shops in it. I parked at a pump, locked my doors and go inside. There was no one at the counter yet and a sign was on the counter saying that they would be right back. So I go and pick up a snack and a drink. Well, when I previously walked in, I noticed a man in his late twenties, kind of wandering in the store. I saw him glance over at me when I walked in, but didn't really think about it not really paying him any mind. I went and opened the door to the soda fridge and was perusing them when he comes right up next to me and opens the one next to mine. This wasn't particularly weird to me, but the fact that he was literally all the way across the store when I came in, and then as soon as I go over there, he does too. I was like, okay, I'ma look for a different drink. So I go to the tea section and stand there for a sec and he follows me right to the next one again. Only this time he looks at me, smiles a creepy ass closed lip smile and says, hi. I do wanna say that even though he could have easily have just been trying to be nice or flirt, I had an instant creepy vibe from him when he first walked over and that intuition has never failed me before. At this point, I just look at him, nod and grab a can of something and go to the counter and think to myself that I can just grab a snack later. He comes up right behind me with one of those jerky sticks, literally did not even grab anything from the refrigerators that he was looking in right next to me and just stands super close. I mean, he was right up behind me. I could feel his body heat and his breath on the back of my neck. And I literally just wanted this cashier to come over here so I could get out the way. I start calling for someone, but no one comes to help. The dude behind me is texting on his phone 
and looking around at the door like he's expecting someone to show up. Finally, I'm like, screw it, I'm out. I leave my drink on the counter and walk out. He follows me. At this point, I literally run to my car and I remember feeling him grasp my jacket. But with the momentum of my arm swinging, he didn't get a firm hold. I hop in, lock the door, and turn my car on at record speed. We make eye contact from out of the corner of my eye, and I see two men running from around the corner of the gas station. They all three run at my car, which is not very far from where the first guy is, and I floor it out of there, almost wrecking my car on the corner. I don't know what they were planning on doing, but I imagine I was about to get kidnapped. I called the police because I don't know where the cashier was, and I just had a bad feeling they did something to them. The guys were gone when the police got there, and I now carry a knife on me when I go out on that drive. Creepy dudes, let's not meet again. I had been living in Prague for about a year. I taught third grade at a bilingual school during the day, and worked door security for a tourist bar at night. Weekends, I would get off work around three or four, depending on how busy it was, at which point I would take the tram from the city center to JCP, where my apartment was located. At the time I was around 22, I had short black hair and round glasses. This is important. One night I stood at the back of the tram, my headphones in despite my phone being dead, they were like a security blanket to prevent me from socializing with drunk English speakers that populated the city center at this time of night. This group of seven guys, looking to be between 25 and 30, were getting loud and drunk. I'm okay with accents, and these guys were definitely British, probably there for a stag do. I ignored them until I hear this conversation. I'd screw that Harry Potter looking girl. Like she screw you, mate. Like I'd give you a choice. Raucous laughter, then high-fiving over the little rape joke. How can you even tell us a girl? One way find out, ain't there? And more laughter. I kept staring at my Kindle and acting like I couldn't hear them all speak English, but internally I was screaming in panic. My stop was only two away, and I figured I'd wanted to be as close to my flat as possible when I got off. So I sit there, ignoring the leering until the tram gets to my stop. I get off. I've got three blocks up and half a block over to get to my flat. They get off. That's fine. I live two blocks away from a very popular club, and quite a few bars and hotels are in that area. So I rationalize to myself, they're not following me. I had a test. A stupid thing I did to see if people were walking behind and following me and I crossed at a weird place in the street. They crossed. I picked up my pace to be walking fast but not running. They pick up their pace, and laughter emanates from the group behind me. But I refuse to look back. I make the three blocks with them steadily closing the gap to me. Then I turn left and bolt, running as fast as I can, key chain with rock in palm and building keys between my thumb and pointer knuckle. I slam the door, and even though it locks automatically and doesn't have a turntable handle, I throw the deadbolt and continue running to my flat, where I also turn the deadbolt. I get to my room, which faces the street, and I curl up in the corner, shaking, as through my open window I can hear, where'd she go? Along with other things that I'm not going to share. After about 15 minutes, I hear them leaving. So yeah, you group of British boys, Let's not meet. And for those of you wondering why I didn't have pepper spray or a weapon, those kind of things are harder to get for a foreigner. I did have a rock keychain on the end of my lanyard that I figured could do some damage, and my boyfriend got me a knife for my birthday last year. This, of course, was after the encounter, so I'm all kitted up now. When I was about 17, me and a few of my friends used to drive out to Union Cemetery in Eastern Connecticut to do some late night ghost hunting. We'd walk around and take photos, never really captured anything too amazing. 
If you haven't been to that part of Connecticut, the roads are very long and windy. It's deep in the middle of the woods, where there are no streetlights and houses are like a mile or two apart from each other. The road to the cemetery itself is probably about 10 to 15 miles single lane road with just a few creepy looking rundown houses. The drive alone is enough to creep you out enough to the point where you wouldn't want to set foot in the cemetery. So anyway, me and two of my friends were on this one trip up. We were heading down the road to the cemetery at two in the morning when this car comes up behind us out of nowhere and starts riding dangerously close behind me to the point where I couldn't even see his headlights in the rearview mirror. We slow down, thinking it's a cop or something. It's hard to see and we can't make out anyone behind the wheel. They slow down and keep almost the exact distance. We sped up again, still keeps the same distance. Didn't think much about it at this point, maybe just some asshole driver in a hurry or something. So we finally get to the cemetery. We didn't want to be seen pulling into the cemetery that late at night, so just past is a rotary with two other roads that cross paths. So we decide to pass the cemetery and go through the rotary to turn around and come back. As we approach it, we go around once and the car follows. We go around a second time, the car follows again. Now we're starting to freak out. The third, fourth and fifth time around the car is still behind us. We can finally see that it's an older car, late 80s or early 90s Corolla or something, but we still can't make out the driver. I finally said screw it, pulled off at a random point in the rotary and just started driving as fast as I could. He still followed us at this point, and we're about 50 or 60 feet ahead of him, and I see him flip off his headlights. Now, remind you there are no street lights on this road, it's pitch black, I'm doing 45 to 50 at this point and we think we lost him. When about a minute later his headlights come back on and he's right behind us again. Then his headlights go out, about 20 seconds or so and he comes back. He's 15 feet behind us. He does this about three or four times. Finally, I slam on the brakes and pretty much come to a dead stop and he's about 10 feet back from us. His headlights go on again and this time I floor it and get up to about 60. His headlights come on again, and I see that he's pretty far away this time and for some reason think to pull into the first driveway I see. So we take a right up a very narrow driveway, and we just sit and wait. No car passes. My heart's pounding like crazy, and I'm getting ready to get out and start running towards the house, but nothing ever happened. No car ever passed us, and we were finally getting the nerve to pull out the driveway about 10 minutes later and there's no sign of the mysterious driver. So we decided to not go to the cemetery that night. My cousin and I thought it would be a good idea to visit a ghost town that was located nearby. We'd heard stories from other relatives saying that they saw a woman and a daughter in a dress standing or walking by the side of a road whenever they passed her their cell phones would either die or completely lose signal, and one of my cousins said his car stopped working as soon as he passed the woman. Seven of us got into a big van and went to the ghost town to see if paranormal activity was true. We were talking and laughing in the van, making fun of people who get scared of the town that they were probably just imagining things. None of us had been to a ghost town before, and we didn't know when we would reach it. As we crossed a bridge that led to the ghost town, the scenery completely changed. A huge fog appeared out of nowhere and covered the whole town and the bridge. The laughter in the van died out, and we were all dead quiet because we knew we had entered the ghost town area. We parked the van on a dirt road that was a little further than the entrance to the ghost town, and we turned off the car and closed all the windows and just sat there looking into the dark empty houses. I felt as if the houses were full of ghosts, just staring at the van, as if we had invaded their space. The atmosphere was so tense and after five minutes of just sitting there in the dark, the driver of the van suddenly turned the car on and drove out of the town. We all wondered why he left so suddenly and asked him but he wouldn't answer. He parked at a nearby gas station and his face was extremely pale. 
He finally started talking and said he saw a little girl walking behind one of the houses coming towards the van. He was so scared, you could see him trembling. He ran inside the gas station and the cashier saw his pale face. And surprisingly, he asked the driver if we had just returned from the ghost town. We told the cashier that we did and that our driver supposedly saw a little girl. The cashier told us that he had passed by the town a few times and saw the same thing. He advised us that if we wanted to experience something paranormal, we should wash the car down with those little window washing things they have at the gas station. We thought this was a good idea and so we all went outside and washed the car all around. We washed the top of the car, the sides, the doors, all the windows and the mirrors washed. Then we took paper towels and dried it completely. We sat at the parking station for a good 10 minutes to see if we were going to go back to the ghost town or just go home. We agreed to switch drivers and return. We went back on the dirt road and traveled into the center of the town. We sat in the van for 15 minutes, just looking out for signs of a girl or signs of activity in the houses. I can't explain how tense the atmosphere was. There were seven of us, all aged 17 plus, in a van, and we had to hold hands. It was weird, but everyone was so scared we couldn't help it. And after 20 minutes in the center of the town, I had begun to see a figure in the distance. It seemed like the girl everyone was talking about, but something was odd. It didn't look like the girl was walking. She was making these odd movements as if she was limping or something. I told everyone to look into the distance and everyone said they saw her also. We watched her and after three to five seconds, the figure looked as if it were getting up. We realized she was crawling and had began to stand up. Right when she stood up, it vanished into the blackness and a loud bang hit the driver's side. The gravel beneath the van sounded as if someone was crawling under the car and three very distinct thumping noises came from underneath. The thumping was directly below my feet and I could feel something hitting the car. Something also stepped onto the back bumper of the car and a small thump could be heard hitting the back window. I made the decision that we should leave immediately and so we did. We got to the gas station. Everyone got out the car and we all saw it. On the driver's side mirror, there was a large, fresh handprint and we were all freaked out. On my way out to the back of the car, there was a little footprint on the back bumper, along with a set of hand and footprints on the back window of the van. We took the paper towel and tried to smear or dry up the handprint, but they wouldn't come off the car. And we sat at the gas station for a good 30 minutes freaking out, and still the prints wouldn't dry. When you touched them, they didn't feel wet or anything, but they looked as if they were. Everyone was scared to get back in the van, but we eventually did, and made sure not to drive the van directly to someone's house, because in our culture, something could have clung onto the van and tried to follow us home, so we went to a nearby Walmart instead. We stayed in this store for three quarters of an hour, and came out, and the prince was still there. We had to call someone to get us and left the van in the parking lot until the next day. The prince eventually vanished and we took the van back to my cousin's house. Never going back to that ghost town again. The house I lived in from birth until I was 11 was pretty close to a hospital for the mentally ill. Nothing like an outlast or house on the hill and it's been shut down for a good few years and turned into houses. My parents worked there. My mum is a psychiatric nurse and my dad worked on the wards where the guys were deviants, so they'd do stuff like eat sheets and play in their own filth, scratch off their lips, stuff like that. We lived in a house about 500 yards away. From an early age, my parents tell me I'd be heard laughing uncontrollably. This lasted until I was two when I'd have four blown conversations, as much as a two year old could and I vividly remember a kid making shapes with his hand in the light, which would set me off. I used to draw on the walls of my room next to my bed. I seemingly was obsessed with drawing police cars and crowds of people chasing a man. At first, my drawings were unintelligible, but as I approached four or five, they were getting better, and that's when my parents remember me drawing. Always police cars chasing a man. 
I showed no interest in police or playing cops and robbers outside of this. I played with the kids. I believed one of the funniest things that happened was he locked me in a coal shed from the outside. He told me to get inside so I did and then ran away. My mum heard me screaming and asked how I got in there as there was only one way to lock it from the outside and they did not believe me that it was this kid. This is where it gets freaky. As I aged, I grew out of taking notice of this person who seemed to frequent my room. I awoke one night, I think I was around six, to a loud bang downstairs. My parents' room was across the landing, so I walked across, looked down at the stairs, and was frozen in terror. We had a draft excluder that was like a snake. It was hanging on the door handle of the front, swinging. There was a man slowly walking up the stairs, and I screamed and the man went away. I heard a voice telling me to come here, and I passed out and woke up in my bed as if it were a dream. I woke up the next day and saw the snake still on the handle, and it freaked me right out. My parents didn't tell me until I was much older, before we'd lived there, that a man had escaped from the hospital, come to the house, stolen a kid, took him back, and hidden him in a shed on the hospital site for two days before he was found. When I was 19 to 20, I used to work for a well-known gas station chain. A lot of the time on evening shift between four and 12, I was alone. Though both gas registers were behind a wall of plexiglass and there was still a two to three foot opening between them where a sliding door is for the night shift to close to avoid robberies. It was about 5 p.m. and still daylight when this guy came in. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up when he walked in. There was something about him that just wasn't right. I should also add that I'm a female. He walked to the back of the store, made it seem like he was looking for something in my coolers and by the back shelves. He never once picked up anything to read or look over and every now and then he'd look up at me and gradually made his way towards me, but would retreat to the back of the store when someone came in and this went on for about 10 minutes. These two women came in and went to my callers at the back of the store. I quickly wrote on a note of paper that said, please stay with me so I can call the cops. Then one of the ladies came to pay. I showed her the note. She nodded and went and told her friend. I had my eye on this creepy guy while trying to keep from completely panicking. One of the ladies leaves the store and the other lingers around it. She looks outside and sees something, then leaves. Immediately after she left and I was about to hit call, the creepy guy rushes up to the counter. He looks at the glass door and is about two feet away from me, then bolts. I look outside and the two ladies are talking to the cop that had just pulled up as the creepy guy was rushing to my counter to get gas. The creepy guy must have seen the cop and decided it wasn't worth it. The cop looks over the guy as he takes off, then comes inside to talk to me. I explained to him his behavior and how my finger was on the call button as soon as he pulled up to get gas. The two ladies came in to make sure I was all right and then left. The cop leaves, then come back around 30 minutes later saying they picked up the guy. He explained the guy was high on meth and he was looking for someone to rob to fuel his habit more. He was also in possession of a hunting knife and the cop figured he would have seriously harmed me to get what he wanted. To this day, I thank my lucky stars the cop pulled up when he did. Dear Method, let's not meet again. Back in the early to mid 80s, I had a paper route in a medium sized southwestern Pennsylvania town. This would have happened around 83 to 84, so I must have been around 13 or so depending on the year. I was out one night connecting the subscription fees from my customers. It was winter because I remember the sky was dark and I don't remember there being snow on the ground, but I was usually done collecting by 6.30. That was on purpose because the penguins usually came on around seven. It was cold and I had decided that I wanted a hot chocolate for the walk home. There was a convenience store in my paper route even now at night, the area is fairly busy with cross town traffic for a dead end southwestern Pennsylvania town. 
while I head on over into the store and got myself a nice cup of hot chocolate. I paid. As I was walking out of the lot, a dude in a pickup truck with a cap over the bed called me over. I figured for some reason that he recognized my paper or receipt book and thought that I may know the area. 13-year-old logic, I guess. I supposed he may have been asking for directions. There was some traffic, and the lot was well lit, so I didn't feel any fear. I head over to the truck, and there were three occupants. A guy much older than me, but not as old as my dad, and two cute girls who I recognized as older than me. But I didn't know how much. The dude looked straight at me and said, these girls want a party, get in. Direct quote that I'll never forget. Now I'm 13 or so, pimply as hell, and weighed about 90 pounds, soaking wet, with 20 pounds of sand in my pocket. These two chicks want to party with me? Sure, I'm a horny 13 year old, but I'd seen a lot of videos in school. This stuff was screaming stranger danger. I politely declined and started walking towards my house. The dude sweetens the deal. Hey, she thinks you're really cute and we have weed and beer. Just get in and let's go. I again decline politely. This whole time the girls have said nothing. I started walking up the road towards my house and the dude pulled out of the lot and began following me in the truck. A couple of hundred feet up the road, a rail bridge with a retaining wall crossed over the road they were on and on the other side, I could go through a very small wooded area into my neighborhood. I went up the embankment and started crossing the tracks. I could see down onto the road, and the dude was leaning out of his truck and looking back at me. Well, I kept walking, and I saw him pass the first turn into my neighborhood. Good, I was home free. My house was three blocks up from the bottom of the hill, and I ran like my life depended on it, when it very well may have done. I got to the third block, and what comes over the crest of the hill? A pickup. It wasn't moving very fast or anything, so I easily made it to the front porch of the duplex before it passed. I told my dad about it a few days later, and he freaked. For a month, he insisted on driving me along my paper route until I was done. The first time a guy in the car pulled up alongside me, he asked if he could buy an extra paper from me. My dad pulled up and yelled at him, to move along. Fortunately, I never saw the truck again. I am a paramedic and have been for about 10 years. My entire career has been spent in emergency medicine, responding to 911 calls and providing advanced life support for life-threatening illness and injuries. The calls we respond to range from inappropriate use of an ambulance to minutes away from death, and oftentimes, it's already too late. I need to forewarn you, this story in particular is going to be dark, and I apologize in advance if there are people that hear this and are affected by the nature of this story. It is going to be graphic, and I'm not gonna gloss over any details because the imagery is important. As awful as this story is, I want to make something good come from it. I want to use this story to preach just a little and hope it finds someone somewhere and helps them. I had been working for a couple of years as a paramedic after I graduated from school. The place I worked primarily was in the city, but our service area was the entire county, which is very rural. When you are in school, you go on ride-alongs. You practice your skills with your receptors and patients, very similar to residency or internships. Your exposure to the job is what gets you while on these ride-alongs. Sometimes you get seriously injured patients and it's terrifying because you sometimes don't always know what to do. You're still learning but you have your preceptor at your back to protect you from any mess ups and guide you. Sometimes though, you don't get lucky enough to experience some of these horrible things. To some, that may seem like a good thing, but it's an important experience as it prepares you for the times when you're alone. 
There are a couple of terms we use: white cloud and black cloud. White cloud refers to a person, either student or professional, who never gets the exciting serious calls. The calls always seem to come in when you're just getting off the shift, or you just left the area when the call came in. And now another ambulance takes it, and this white cloud can follow the person for any length of time. Black cloud is, of course, the opposite. When I was in school, I was a white cloud. I got a few cardiac arrests, bad accidents, and things like that, but nothing that ever really stood out as unique. So, a couple of years into my career, this white cloud is still kind of hanging over me. That's not to say I hadn't had bad calls before. I had, but it's not the same. The day this story takes place is Christmas Eve. I worked from 7 a.m. Christmas Eve to 7 a.m. Christmas Day. Now, from what I remember, the day was pretty slow. Most people are with their families, not going outside, getting into accidents, or causing mischief. I was working with the charge medic at the time. And a brand new EMT who was going through his field orientation process. A few of my co-workers made a Christmas dinner that day, so we all had hot food to enjoy while we were at work and away from our families. At our station, we had two ambulances there, with two crews: myself, my partner, and our field orientation process guy, and the other crew. When night comes. If a call comes into our station, the two crews just rotate calls so that we get to sleep a little bit more. It was around 11 p.m., and I was sitting in the recliner watching TV when a call came into our station that required us to respond out of the county. One of the guys on the other crew, who was a friend of mine, was asleep in the recliner next to me, so I took the call. The call was initially for a woman who had fallen and hit her head, but was conscious and breathing. Due to the nature of the injury, we responded emergency. It was probably around 15-minute drive to get to the person's house. As we're getting close, dispatch informs us that the patient is not conscious but breathing. And as we approach the residence, driving down the street, where this little development is, there are flashing lights everywhere. Sheriff's deputies, police, fire department—they were all there, with some even blocking the entrance to the street. For just a simple head injury, we thought it was pretty weird, and it set a weird vibe for the call. One of the deputies saw us coming and moved his car to allow us through. Once we got through, this part of the street ended in a cul-de-sac with houses all around it. People were standing on their front porches, around, looking at what was going on. We arrived at the address. There is a vehicle parked in the driveway, still running, with officers all around. The driver's side door was open, and there was an officer standing there, looking like he was talking to someone sitting in the driver's seat. I walked up first with my partner, our EMT, and the training guy. As I approached the rear of the vehicle, I see there is definitely someone sitting inside. There is also a man, middle-aged, in plain clothes. Standing in front of the vehicle, his lower half hit by the headlights, he has his hands in his pockets and is looking rather intently at the person in the vehicle. I walk up to the officer and get a report from him. While the officer is telling me what's going on, I look at the person in the driver's seat. The person sitting in the driver's seat was a middle-aged woman, maybe in her mid forties to fifties, sitting back with her head against the headrest. Her arms hanging down her side. I can visibly see her breathing, hear her moaning, but not talking. Her eyes are closed. There's a bit of blood running down from her head, past her cheeks, and down to her chin. There is also a small stream of blood coming from her nose. The officer tells me that she was inside with her family when she came out to get something from the car. The officer says the woman's husband, and. Gestures to the man standing in front of the car, came out to check on her because she was out there for a while. When the husband saw his wife was bleeding, he figured she must have fallen or hit her head on something, so he dialed nine one one. The officer tells me the woman had not been responding to him. I attempt to speak to the woman, but she doesn't answer. She continues to moan, 
and I perform a sternum rub to cause painful stimuli and hope to get some sort of reaction, but there isn't one. I asked the husband if she'd been drinking tonight or if she abuses of any drugs that he knows of. He says that she had a few glasses of wine, but no drug use. At this point, I'm thinking she has a head injury and potentially a brain bleed because she's not responding appropriately. I stand where the officer was standing in the driver's side door as I'm performing my assessment. I can't see where the blood is coming from, so I figure she has a laceration or something in her hair that isn't visible. It's at this time that the officer comes up to me. He says, we also found this in the driver's side door compartment. He produces a revolver. I look at the officer and look at the revolver. He looks at me and holds it out. I grab it, flip out the cylinder, and at the same time think, oh crap. In the cylinder is one brass casing with the primer indented, meaning a round had been fired. With this new information and based on the bleeding, I assumed the patient had put the gun to her temple or something. The fact that she is still breathing and making noises led me to assume that she missed or that the bullet miraculously bounced off if she held it at a weird angle. Due to the potential for significant head trauma, I decide we need to place a cervical collar on the woman in case of spinal injury too. I ask if one of the fire departments can grab a collar out the ambulance. I open the back door of the vehicle and get behind the woman so I can hold her head stable while the fireman places the collar on. It's only when I do this that I see what's really going on. As I slide in behind the patient, I can see the back of her head, something I will never be able to unsee. Looking at the back of her head, I see a grapefruit sized hole. With my flashlight, I look at the hole and it is almost empty, except for a large piece of skull that is floating on the top of a blood and brain soup. I look up and on the headliner of the vehicle is a two foot in diameter halo of blood and brain painted above her with tiny pieces of skull stuck into the fabric. And I look back at the hole. It's a chilly night, so I can see heat vapors coming from out the hole, similar to how you'd be able to see your breath on a cold day. I look out the vehicle at my partner and say, we need to go now. Either the look on my face or his sense caused him to peek inside the vehicle and see what was coming. His eyes grew wide and he just said, holy crap. Our EMT trainee quickly went to the ambulance and grabbed the stretcher and backboard. Up until this point, we were taking our time carefully getting her out of the vehicle. But now, carefully and slowly, turned into just getting her out of the vehicle. Our EMT also grabbed a few huge trauma dressings and gorge wraps. I placed the trauma dressing over the hole and wrapped the ever living crap out of it around her head so that when we moved her onto the stretcher, nothing would spill out. With the help of the fire department and police, we moved the woman onto the backboard and put her on the stretcher. The whole time the husband has been standing at the front of the vehicle watching, not understanding what's happened. As we get to the woman on the stretcher, he comes over and I can see he now has tears on his face. He bends down, kisses her on the cheeks and says, I love you. We quickly get the woman in the ambulance. Due to the woman's injury, her cerebellum, the largest part of the brain is almost completely gone, meaning she has no motor function, no muscle tone and no cognitive abilities. Her brain stem, however, is still intact. The bullet missed it. The brain stem controls the body's autonomic functions like respiratory rate, heart rate and blood pressure. Due to this, when we moved the woman to the stretcher, her tongue fell against the back of her oral airway, causing a blockage. I knew immediately this was going to happen, so I had my partner set up the intubator supplies for me. In the ambulance, I placed a laryngoscope, a bladed device used in intubation into the patient's mouth to move her jaw and tongue forward, opening her airway. I see through the hole of the roof of the woman's mouth I slide the endotracheal tube through the woman's vocal cords into her trachea. This gives us a secured airway so we can ventilate the patient. My patient uses an intraosseous needle to obtain vascular access, 
does the same thing as an IV, but it goes into the bone, and medication and fluids are absorbed by the bone marrow. I place the patient onto the cardiac monitor, check her blood pressure and oxygen, and at the time I thought it was the strangest thing. Her blood pressure was actually good. Her heart rate was normal, her oxygen was good, and her cardiac rhythm was normal. We start transporting emergent to the hospital, and I give them a heads up, activating the trauma team. After the call, we went back to the station to restock the ambulance and clean up. That's when I saw the bits of bone and blood on my pants and shirt. Luckily, the charge medic let me go home and take a shower and put on a new pair of clothes. After I changed, I went back to work, and the rest of the shift was uneventful. I learned that the next morning around 9am, the family had decided to remove life support, and the woman passed away. For many years after that call, I didn't notice a change. I kept doing what I do best, and never really thought I had been affected by it, until I realized I was. A couple of years ago, I had a bad relationship that made me start thinking about myself and how I am. It was something that was always there, but I never really thought about it. I just thought it was my personality and who I developed into as an adult. I realized how angry I was. I was not a mean person, but very simple, stupid things would set me off and I had a bad temper. I was very cynical of the world and still am. And what I thought was a stomach problem, I started thinking, maybe it's anxiety. I decided that I wanted to figure out what caused me to be this way, and wanted to figure out why I think the way I do, and act the way I do. So I went to see a psychologist. After many months of visiting, my psychologist came up with the PTSD diagnosis. I hated it the first time. I hated being categorized as someone with PTSD. It didn't make sense. I can handle anything, nothing bothers me. But during those visits as we conversed, the one thing that kept coming up was that call. I didn't realize how much it actually affected me. How much of a wall that I built to shut everyone out, to not see who I really am and to protect myself. The more I thought about it, the more I came to realize it probably makes sense. The reason I tell this story the way I do, with the graphic details, is because I think everyone needs to understand it in its entirety. How mental health does not only affect a single person, but everyone around them. Like I said, I'm gonna get a little preachy. But this is something that we talk about at work quite a lot. And there are several co-workers on the ambulance, even now, that I talk with about this stuff. One of them, if not number one cause of death in first responders, is suicide. If you are someone who has thought about or attempted suicide in the past, you need to know that taking your life doesn't only affect you. You may think it will be better this way, but I assure you it will not. People often say how selfish suicide is, and it's true, because once you're gone, you have no idea of the amount of lives that have been impacted by you. If you don't think this is true or that no one will care, maybe you need to go back and re-listen to my story. Because I guarantee people care. I care. So find someone, anyone, and just talk. Be honest. Get to know them. Tell them how you're feeling. I know it's hard, it was for me. But it does get better. And you have to try. So if anyone you know has or does struggle with mental health issues, reach out. Just be an ear. You don't have to try and solve the problem, but just listen. If you listen, you may hear something that can help save someone's life. And if you struggle with mental health issues and think there is no one for you to talk to, you're wrong. It can be a professional. It can be a person you consider a close friend or relative. If you feel like none of these options work for you, or you are considering doing something dangerous, go to your local emergency room, call 911. That's what we're here for. Police, fire, EMS, ER staff. People may not think of these people to call when you have a mental emergency, but I can tell you firsthand, we deal with a lot more than you think. And we are trained in how to deal with people in these situations. All of us. Even if you don't know what to say. Even if you just make the call. It will get things started. And hopefully, you can find the help you deserve. There is always someone to talk to.
A couple of years back, some friends and I decided to take a couple of weeks off and go on a road trip. Our goal was to drive through the states from the southeast up to Pennsylvania and back. We would drive through the night and pitch our tents before dusk, sleep a little and spend the day checking out the area we stopped in. Sometimes it would be out in the middle of nowhere, sometimes near a city. It was interesting to do things that way. We were driving through Alabama when we made our stop. Thing about Alabama is the interstate through it is incredibly boring, pretty much straight and a lot of trees. We knew this in advance, so we charted a path through that would make us drive through the more rural areas. We got about three-fourths of the way through from south to north when we decided to stop for the morning. We found a large patch of field that didn't have a no trespassing sign visible and set up camp. Since we took turns driving, the rest of us took naps in the car. When we stopped to camp, it was mostly to rest the car. It was mostly to be able to take a nap without being cramped together or have someone else drool on you. It was about noon when everyone was ready to pack up and explore. The spot we camped in was a beautiful short grass field about 500 or so feet from where we chilled was a barn. It looked new and was really picturesque. We packed everything back into the car and decided to hoof it over to the barn and check it out. Everyone took off in different directions when we got to look around. I happened to be on the side. I was poking around the tall grass that had started to conceal some equipment when I heard one of my friends yelling. I walked into the barn and the others had already joined my loud friend. They were standing around what looked to be a trap door on the floor near the back of the barn. My friend tells me she heard crying and when she found the trap door it stopped. We all stood there for a minute in silence, listening. All we heard was the wind blowing through the barn. I look up and start to say something when out of nowhere there's a large crash. It sounded like something slammed up against the other side of the trap door. Everyone booked it without a second glance except me. I couldn't move, my legs didn't work. I just stood there staring at the door in wide-eyed terror. My brain was screaming for me to run, begging my legs to move, and I couldn't. Then, like a rubber band snapping into place, my body spun 180 degrees in the opposite direction. After what felt like an eternity, my legs decided to act. Just as I felt my legs start to push off, the world went black, pitch black. It looked like and felt like someone threw a heavy blanket over me. Then the screaming started. It sounded like a young child was screaming at the top of their lungs. It never stopped. There was no pause for breath. I think I screamed. I say I think because I couldn't hear myself screaming over the child's scream. I felt something icy cold in my chest and started having trouble breathing. It felt like something grabbed my heart. Primal survival instincts kicked in and I began to thrash my arms around hoping to hit something, anything that would make it stop. It didn't help. I gathered as much strength left and forced myself to run. I didn't know where I was and it didn't matter. I just had to run. And I did. Full speed straight into a low hanging beam. I was down and out. I don't know how long though. I remember waking up in the grass near my car. My left eye was sealed shut from dried blood. Everyone was sitting next to the car not talking. When they noticed I woke up, they helped me get cleaned up. I used a bottle of water to clean the blood off my face and bandages from the first aid kit to cover the huge gash in my forehead. I asked what happened, and they told me that they had made it to the car when they realized I wasn't with them. Of course, since it was my car, I had the keys, so they were looking out. That's when they heard me screaming. They actually told me they were thinking of running to town to get the police instead of going back for me. I never asked them why they decided to come back for me. I'm just glad they did. They told me when they found me, I was lying on the floor bleeding. The trap door was wide open, and they actually dragged me across the floor by my feet because no one would come around the other side of me and have their back to the door. Here's the kicker. After the explanation of all of this, one of them tells me to turn around and check out the barn. I look behind me, 
and the beautiful barn that we saw and went to investigate was now decrepit and old. I looked back at my friends and they stared back at me with blank expressions without saying anything else. I hand my keys to one of my friends and drive off. We didn't camp out like that again for the rest of the trip. We found campgrounds to stay at or just slept in the car. None of us have ever mentioned the incident since. When I was in my teens, my family went for a retreat to an old bungalow near the sea. There was a huge mango tree at the side of the garden. I woke up at 3am due to being in unfamiliar surroundings and noticed my dad outside of the garden staring at the mango tree. I couldn't get back to sleep, so I joined my dad out on the garden. We kept looking at those big juicy mangoes located very high up the tree. And at the time I thought it would be a great idea to climb up and pluck some at 3 in the morning. I climbed up to about 15 feet, started plucking those mangoes when my dad collected them from down below. While I was trying to reach a particular mango on a faraway branch, I felt like my hair fell down covering half my face, so I absentmindedly tucked it behind my ears. As I tried to reach it again, it fell down covering part of my face again. Then I froze. Since when did my hair get so long? I didn't dare look up and kept staring down at my dad who was busy picking up mangoes and didn't have a clue to what was going on. Slowly I made my way back down, and only plucked up the courage to look up once both my feet were firmly planted on the ground. I didn't manage to see anything. That's when I heard the faint female laughter coming from up the tree. Let me take you back to the summer of 2016. I was 15, when all of the weird clown stuff was happening. Me and my little sister and my mother went on a road trip to see my grandparents. Now at this point, we were on our way back home, and we were in Georgia. We stopped at a gas station around 6am, and it was still very dim outside. My sister and I were dead asleep, until we heard my mum leave the car. My sister was still asleep. Let me set up the scene real quick. Me and my sister were laying in the back seat. Her head was on the opposite side of the car and we were directly next to each other on the seat so I could see perfectly out of her side of the window. Anyway, I wake up and I'm really groggy, but suddenly my attention is jerked to maximum capacity when I heard a horrifying pitchy laugh that didn't even sound real. In that moment though, I was in some weird lucid dream state until I snapped back to reality. I sat up 90 degrees and looked out the windshield, and there was this man with a red balloon dressed up very similarly to the original Pennywise, but dirtier and cheaper. I watched in actual disbelief as he went from person to person laughing in people's faces. He went up to a little girl of about six and her mother, pinched their cheeks, got up in her face and said something along the lines of, Hey princess, wanna be my friend? And when the mum hit him and screamed to get the hell away from them, he started maniacally laughing. Then he skipped over to my mum's car, saw me inside literally shaking under my blanket and pressed his face up against the glass really hard and started pointing and laughing. I pulled the blankets up above my head, but I could still hear him laughing his butt off. I swear I heard him try and jiggle the door handle a few times as well. The only thing that sent him away was the same mother of the little girl yelling at him and threatening to call the police. I heard him leave, and so when I sat up I saw him skipping away, and he was still laughing. It almost sounded like gagging at this point. I mean honestly about 45 minutes after he left, we came across an active missing person search in a forest by the road. Not too far away from that gas station. I have no idea if he was involved but I remember riding by and feeling like it could have easily been my sister or I. I was 15 then, and 19 now. I'm a 19 year old dude that loves horror movies, gore and scary things, but the details of this weird ass experience have never left my mind. Although I was really upset at the time, I'm glad I have an interesting story to share with all of you. But it's really scary to think about what would have happened if the car doors weren't locked. It makes me nauseous.
This happened to me ten years ago. I was riding a bicycle from one city through a lane. It was 10 p.m., and this was after hanging out with friends. Before I was leaving, they told me for lols, hey, better not go through the lane. There might be guys in a van waiting for you, and then talking about you inside the van. You see, the teachers in the first few grades of elementary school always told us not to go into cows or vans of strangers, and then they might take us and beat the crap out of us. And I'm like, huh, don't worry, see ya. So I'm riding home through a one-way lane, when suddenly I see a van going against me. I thought it was some random car, because it didn't have their lights on and it was really dark. Then a man suddenly turns the lights on in the car and it slows down. I pass through and five seconds later they shout at me, Hey you! I turn back to see a van with doors open and two 40-year-old guys. I stopped and asked, What? One of the guys just shouted, Come over here. Why don't you come? I was thinking about what the teachers always told us, and I jumped on my bike and continued cycling as fast as I could, pulling the lame, I don't have time. You don't have time? He responds. I'll get in the van, turn around, and I'll bet you will. I'm like, that's it, they're coming for me. I was two miles away from where I lived, as I lived in quite a small village. In a few streets, there were no lights, and I turn around while riding as fast as possible and see they rotated the van, but it still wasn't moving. The fact that I hadn't ridden a bicycle in four years due to physical injury was quite disconcerting, but I rode as hard as I possibly could, faster than I ever have before, and I turned back every five seconds to see if they were coming for me. Fortunately, they stayed stationary on the road, but I didn't stop pedaling until I made it home. I'm not sure if they were some criminals or angry people being stuck on a forgotten road in the middle of nowhere, but for a 15-year-old kid, what the hell could I have done to help them? Over 10 years ago, my boyfriend and I were driving around in the country over an hour from our house. We were just driving for the hell of it, but we were also half-heartedly looking for this little waterfall we'd heard about in the area. So we left the main highway and took this side road which wound up and down a big hill, and eventually we found ourselves down in a little hollow, which slowly opened up into a big valley. Everything seemed normal until we passed these stone gate posts, which then led us to this crazy little split road which had an avenue of carefully planted trees running down the median. We were seriously out in the middle of nowhere, and there was no reason that we could fathom for this fancy road out here to exist. We passed a few big abandoned buildings and grand steps which led to empty concrete foundations. But other than that, there were just a few scattered regular lived-in homes. After finding the waterfall's location, we turned around and headed back on the way we came, and finally saw a historical marker. Turns out this was one of only a handful of ghost towns in our state, and the name immediately rang bells, as a co-worker who was into the supernatural had just told me about this place, and that it was seriously haunted. It had been the site of a big printing press in the early 1900s, and an entire nearly self-sufficient town had grown up around it. It was apparently quite fancy in its heyday, with a big hotel, a trade school, and several health spas, as doctors used to send people to the area to recover from tuberculosis. When the press closed, the town quickly went downhill, and the buildings mostly either fell or burnt down, except for the few that we'd seen. I think the official year of its demise was 1976, when the post office closed. We drove home that day without incident, but a few weeks later, my boyfriend's younger sister was staying the night at our place and we began telling ghost stories. The two of us looked at each other like, you thinking what I'm thinking? And asked if she wanted to see a ghost town right now. She was game and we hopped in the car a little after 1 a.m. and drove to this place. We were all excited and found ourselves going down that hill into the valley in no time. It was 2 a.m. at this point 
and we thought we would just do a quick circuit down the avenue of trees and turn around. Half the farm was just being out at this hour and having the freedom to go wherever we wanted, whenever, as we were only 18 at the time and had just gotten our own place. We reached the end of the avenue and turned around. No sign of any ghosts, but my boyfriend said something I will never forget. Maybe we'll see a Bigfoot instead. The three of us got a hearty laugh out of that, as we believed in ghosts, but Bigfoot seemed silly. We passed the stone gate posts and a little ways up on the left, we began to see a few lived in houses, signaling the end of the ghost town. And this is where it hit the fan. As our car crept up the road, our headlights hit this thing. It was standing in a ditch on the left side of the road on two legs and was using its hands or four paws like it was looking for something on the embankment it was facing. It was kind of hunched over, but if it stood straight up, it would have been around five feet tall, covered in brownish matted hair and fur. The body just looked like a big shapeless mass of hair with arms and legs that seemed relatively skinny compared to the body. And when it turned its head to stare at us, we realized it didn't have a muzzle, but instead a flat face like an ape. Even with our bright lights on, we couldn't see a mouth or nose, just the eyes. And they were the cliche glowing red eyes like two pinpricks in this awful featureless face. It wasn't simple eye shine from our headlights. It was like they glowed from their own accord. We saw the damn thing and simultaneously yelled and asked if it was a bear. We were all very confused. All the while it just stood there staring. It wasn't scared and didn't move a muscle other than straighten up and turn its head to look at us when our lights first hit it. All these thoughts were racing through our heads and we all sensed that something was very off about this encounter. Honestly, we were all afraid of it. It didn't give off a warm nor fuzzy feeling and I wanted to get the hell out of that valley ASAP. We had slowed the car down to a crawl to get a good look at it, but when our brains tried to process it and came up with unidentified, we stepped on it and flew out of there. On the way, we passed a huge number of deer on the road, and I swear I felt like they were aware of this thing and may have just been running from it or avoiding it. I remember feeling worried for them, having to share the woods with this being. And at that point, just before topping the hill, a huge white owl swooped out of the trees and flew over our car. We all took that as a sign that we were safe and out of this thing's dominion. To this day, I've never seen another white owl. The whole way home, we were stunned and were trying our best to debunk this encounter and identify the creature as a regular animal. When we got back to the house, I pulled out this book I have on animals in our parts of the world and it listed the color of their eyes when they shone into. The only animal that has a red eye shine is a night heron, and that thing sure as hell wasn't a bird. The next day, I even called the historical society of the nearest actual town and asked about the ghost town. The woman literally says, um, it has a golf course. Why wouldn't she tell me anything about this place? It did indeed have a history worth mentioning, and she knew that I was asking about it because she pointed out the golf course, which is just a few miles down the road. I later found out that, like most others, this abandoned town had attracted vandals and morons who had done all sorts of damage in the past, but most people looking to piss around and tear things up don't call historical societies beforehand, so that quite didn't explain her reluctance to tell me anything. After the encounter, we of course told our friends and family, hoping that someone would say, oh, it's just probably a blah, 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 and identify it for us, but no one ever could. The only thing this did was convince some of our friends to go investigate for themselves, and they would come back telling wild stories of being chased off by military people. I don't know what happened to our friends, but part of me thinks they were being stupid lurking around the buildings and had to be scared off like the idiot young'uns there were especially considering all the vandalism which has occurred within the ghost town itself. But the odd thing is that I've read local forums about the ghost towns and many people do indeed believe that there is some weird military business going on there. Maybe they're using it as a covert training facility, I don't know. 
This is just one of those places which becomes weirder and weirder the more you investigate. This past year I found a video online of some EVP sessions a local paranormal group captured in a nearby house. There are multiple voices and one is a young girl who recited a rhyme which you can hear clear as day. Then you hear someone shush her and we continue the rhyme in a whisper. The rhyme is from Genie on Pee Wee Herman. And on another site, I found a very unsettling account of a group of kids being led into the woods by people they thought were their family members, and it wasn't. I just know that this place is freaky and that the three of us saw something there that doesn't exist in any natural history book. I was even trying to blame it on an animal that is said to be extinct. To this day, I can see that creature in my mind standing there staring at us, its flat face and glowing red eyes. We only went back to that valley once after that, at 2.30 in the morning. We didn't see the creature, but there was a large fire burning in an open field not far from there, but there was no one to be found. No people, no cars, nothing. And we certainly weren't going to go out and investigate ourselves. This story took place in the 70s. My father's friend is a forest ranger, who also happens to be a competitive pistol shooter, like who can hit the most targets the fastest sort of thing. He is driving with his wife, playing car poker with a local car club. Basically, the group comes up with objectives, generally places to drive to, and you're awarded a card for accomplishing them. The goal, of course, is to get the best hand. All of these objectives are completed over the weekend and all done individually. That is, the drivers go their own way. This is not a caravan. So he and his wife were driving their convertible, I think it's a Triumph, along the back roads of Western Washington near Concrete. They come around a bend in the road and a large pickup dragging a good sized log comes tearing out perpendicular to the road so that the log is now blocking their path. Putting the car in reverse and looking behind them, the husband sees another truck do the same thing, effectively boxing him and his wife in. Each pickup bed is occupied by three or four rednecks, one of whom has a shotgun. One of the rednecks, clearly the leader, jumps down from the bed and walks over to the car. It being a nice day, the windows are already down, the redneck leader leans into the car and leers at the man's wife. It's a fine looking woman you got there. The husband's pulse races. Being a competitive shooter and a forest ranger, technically a peace offering, the husband carries a pistol under the seat of his car. While the leader of the redneck bandits walks up to the car, the husband slowly reaches under his seat and pulled up his revolver and concealed it under his legs. As soon as he heard the leader imply that these men were going to rape his wife, he grabbed the leader by the collar and pulled the pistol to his forehead. You'll have to move that log in front of us or I'm going to blow your head off. The leader went silent for a moment, the calculations running in his head. The leader said, you can't get all of us. Sure, but you'll be dead. Self-preservation rolling the day, the leader motioned for the front log to be moved. The husband drove slowly forward, keeping hold of the leader's collar until he was clear of the obstacle. He made it past and got the hell out of there. When I got out of high school around 2003, finding a job was difficult. So I took whatever horrible jobs I could to get by. When I found a job cleaning fire and water damage full time, I was excited to have a steady income and start saving, but this quickly turned into a nightmare that I had to endure for almost two years. The company I worked for put me on my first job, which was a water damage cleaner, where a basement flooded with sewage. So after a few days of work, we finished it and moved on to the next job. My boss then called me into his office the next morning and told me about a special crew that he was setting up and asked if I would be the crew leader supervising three other guys that were just hired. I found this strange, as I had only been working there a total of three days, 
I figured my work ethic was already paying off, and I would get a raise. I only made ten an hour to start. Not only did I not get the raise, but I got no training in the new position other than a work van with cleaning material, and the phone numbers for the three new guys that were also hired to do the fire slash water damage cleanup. The boss told me what tools were best to use, and what cleaning products to use to sanitize, along with where everything was located in the van. With hazmat suits and respirators, but he was vague about what kind of things I would clean up. He just said the situations were always different, and that I would get detailed instructions each job. He called my position CSC crew leader. The boss told me I would never have to see the deceased, as the coroners would have the remains gone by the time my crew got there, and to use logic to determine what needed to be removed from the homes and what could be cleaned. The first job I had in my new position, which the boss told me about when I got to the office, was cleaning up the remains of an elderly man or woman who died in their house, who had been laying in a chair. When we arrived, the coroner had come inside to show me a few things that were considered hazardous, materials that needed to be removed due to the risk of disease. I guess my boss knew a few people from the country coroner's office. And much of the work came from their recommendations. Not only was the deceased still in the house, but was fully visible to me and the other guy, and you could smell the rot through the mask, as the house had no air conditioning, and this was mid-June. The coroner was backed up and waiting on additional people to show up to load the body as it was falling apart. And I call it the body, because I honestly couldn't tell if it was male or female. And was trying to not look at it for too long, as it was disturbing. The other three guys I worked with handled it well, but two got sick from the smell and had to go outside to puke. We all waited outside after the coroner showed us the chair, the fluids that leaked into the carpet, and the basement where the fluids went through the subfloor and puddled onto some boxes in the basement. The coroner's support arrived and took the deceased out. And me and the crew started working. After about five minutes, weird things started to happen. The first of which was when I began to disassemble the chair. I had to remove the back of the chair, and was putting it on the special hazmat bags that I was given. And the base started to rock when I was about ten feet away, putting the bag with the back of the chair by the front door. No one else was in the same room, as the other guys were in the basement dealing with moving boxes. I brushed it off and took apart the base of the chair as much as I could, and when I got it in the bag, I got a chill up my back, and then began feeling sick. I just figured it was the shock of what I was cleaning hit me, and pushed on. Even though the chill was strange, as I was very hot in full hazmat in June. Next was removing the carpet and assessing the floor to see if it could be cleaned. Or if we had to remove that section of floor, so I called the boss to ask him, and he told me to just pour the special cleaner on the area, to soak into the floorboards, and it would be fine. So, I got it out of the truck where he said it was, and brought it inside. When I got inside, all three of the guys in the basement were scrambling to get out of the basement, tripping over each other, and all three ran out. When I asked them what was up, all three said. There was someone in the cluttered basement, and they assumed it was a homeless person or a junkie, as Detroit has many issues with these kind of things. I listened at one of the open windows to the basement. It's kind of the first thing we did when we started working: open as many windows as possible, prop the doors open so maybe someone got inside then, or possibly before we got there and was hiding. After listening a few minutes and hearing nothing, me and another worker. Went inside, armed with a mag light and a piece of metal fence post, and searched the basement. Nothing was down there, but there were footprints of the shoe covers we used. But when we started up the stairs, we heard a horrible hacking cough from somewhere in the basement. When we looked for it, there was nothing. But the corners of the basement had a bunch of dust stirred up, like someone was moving things very recently, which weirded us both out. We called the guys back, 
and they got back to the boxes, but all of them kept feeling like they were being touched while throwing away material from the boxes that got fluids on them. I went back to my upstairs job, but found that the cleaner I put next to the floorboards was gone, and I started getting frustrated, as it was the only jug I had of this cleaner, and I clearly remembered it being set next to the area before the guys ran up the stairs and my attention was redirected. I began to take out trash, figuring it I would find it eventually, or the basement guys took it for the floor, and I found it sat beside the bag that had the back of the chair. This is impossible. There were like six other bags in front of this one near the front door, and this was a gallon bottle of cleaner. Again, I got the chills, but this one was brought on by what sounded like a whisper that I could not make out the words to. I cleaned the floorboards and moved out trash, job complete. That night, each member of my crew had a dream about an older man telling us that we weren't welcome in his home and not to touch his belongings and that we needed to leave. In my dream, I was alone in his house. The old man cried and told me I was destroying his things and that he couldn't replace anything. He was trying to push me out of his house, but it was like I was ignoring him. Even when he would push me and scream at me, there was no reaction from me. He then threw my cleaner into the garbage pile that I had made by the front door, exactly where I had found it. Two of the three guys in the crew told me their dreams about the old man pushing them as they went through boxes of ruined pictures and other old stuff that needed to be thrown out due to the risk of the disease from fluids. They also said it was like they had no control and were on autopilot. They said they were sad but couldn't do anything. The thing that got me about the dreams of the other two guys was that they both said the man was getting so upset that he began violently coughing and that the man kept grabbing their arms when they would touch boxes or throw things in the trash. Neither of the guys were in the house when me and the other guy heard the coughing from the basement. The guy that went into the basement with me said he had a dream but all he remembers is waking up, sad, as if he'd done something wrong and had a horrible coughing fit, which might have just been a coincidence, but I connected it in my mind as related to the other dreams. We all talked about it and came to the conclusion that we were all just having a reaction to a situation and it was nothing more than our brains coping with what we had to do. I'm very into psychology, so I rationalized it the best I could and we hoped for better assignments the next day. The next few jobs weren't so bad. Cleaning up blood at a home invasion, no casualties, but a huge mess. And then there were a few other bloody crime scenes with casualties, but nothing notable happened. About two weeks into the job, we began to learn the tricks of the trade and were split into two different groups that I was responsible to manage as crew leader. So I would have to go to different sites if the other two guys had an issue or didn't know what to do. I thought I was getting used to the job as well as the other guys, as we had no other experiences like the first job, but I was wrong. One of our next jobs was the suicide of a man that was middle-aged. The coroner had already removed the body, but it was a mess. The guy had shot himself with what I think was a large caliber handgun or shotgun as the spray was everywhere in the basement, in like a second living room. There were skull fragments lodged in drywall, brain matter all over, and again, he was not found for a bit. So the smell was horrible. The first step in cleaning this was using our backpack vacuum cleaner to suck up all the biomaterial. The coroner told us when we went in that he and his partner were extremely uneasy in the house it felt strange, and we immediately started getting a claustrophobic, suffocating feeling when we went into the basement as well. To make matters worse, the family of the man had come over and were crying upstairs, but the vacuum noise helped cancel out that noise. While I was cleaning, the power to the lights went out, and it was completely pitch black. This was strange because my vacuum still worked, and my crewmates started screaming at this point, so I turned off my vacuum and went up. I thought maybe he had touched a wire to the lights, but my vacuum unit was turned off, 
and he was still screaming, and I could hear things being knocked over. I started fumbling around for my flashlight on my tool belt, and yelled for my friend asking what was going on, but all I got back was panicked screaming, and then I saw in the pitch black something darker that was moving in my direction, and I admit I freaked out. I slipped trying to back up, still looking in my belt for the flashlight, and found it when I hit the basement wall. I turned the light on, aimed at the blackest shape I've ever seen, and when the light turned on, I saw the shape of a man wearing a flannel shirt, beard, and an expression like he was about to attack me. And then it was just gone. My crewmate was behind where the entity was, sitting on the floor, rocking with his hands on his head. When I approached, he picked up his flashlight off the ground, turned it on, and then ran up the stairs outside and threw up. I followed behind him, and asked if he was okay and why he was screaming. I thought I just imagined the entity and the man, because his screaming scared me. But he told me that as he was scrubbing the wall, he felt something pulling on him, something in his tool belt, and he thought it was me. But when he turned around, the lights went out, and he was engulfed by what he said was like dark smoke, and immediately couldn't breathe and was struggling to move. He managed to pull his flashlight out, but it was knocked out of his hand like his wrist was grabbed with force, and he managed to scream. When he screamed, trinkets started falling off an entertainment center that was about three feet to his side, and the black smoke moved back. But he was close to passing out from exertion, he also said he lost hearing and didn't know that any noise came out when he started screaming, and that the stuff started falling off the shelves and was landing on him, which is why he was covering his head. He said it felt like a weight was lifted off him when the dark smoke backed up, but he felt sick right away, and the light from my flashlight made the sick feeling intensify. We took nearly an hour lunch, where he just sat there pale as ever, and didn't say much, other than he breathed in the smoke and didn't feel right. I got him some Gatorade, and his colour started to come back. I never told him I saw a man when I turned my light on, because we still needed to finish, and I didn't want to put that scene in my head, since he never mentioned seeing it. When we went back, the lights in the basement were on again. Half the things that fell from the shelves were back on the entertainment centre, and the TV was on baseball, and there was also a different smell in the room, similar to burnt hair. My worker stayed a half hour, got sick again and went home for the day, leaving me alone to finish the job, which I didn't want to do, but I had to as the other guys had their own job. After cleaning up everything with my vacuum, I began scrubbing the old blood, which is hard after it congeals, mixed in with brain matter and it's like glue, even with cleaner. While I was finishing up, I kept seeing the shape of a person, away in the side of my vision. Each time I would smell that strange burnt hair scent, and a few times, I also felt like a force was pulling at items on my belt. Not sure which items, as there were several there. When I finished the job, I went to use the bathroom upstairs, and in the hallway along the way, I heard a muffled cry or moan. I froze up, staying still, thinking maybe a family member had come back, and when I panned around there was nothing, but I saw a picture on the wall of a man with a beard wearing a flannel, and several other pictures in the hallway of other scenarios of the same man in different flannels, with deer or fish or family. I had not seen a picture of that man as I had not been anywhere else in the house, nor did I use the bathroom downstairs because pulling off a hazmat suit is a pain. As I was securing the house, closing all the windows, locking the doors, and shutting down every light with the front porch light, I saw the front curtain move, and again, saw the darker than black form in the front window. The last experience I will share happened in mid-July, in a very bad area in Detroit. There had been an incident, where a guy supposedly tried to abduct a child, was stopped by people in the neighborhood who beat the man very badly, and he escaped to his house, where the neighborhood people quickly called the police, and civilians surrounded the man's house to prevent escape. 
The police response time in this area is horrible, and the people were throwing rocks through the man's window and damaging his car. The man was hurt bad by the mob, and was hurt by a rock or glass, and then died in the house. This was an assumption by the DPD. From what the police officer told me, it was a misunderstanding, and the man picked up a girl that was injured riding her bike, and some kids that knew her told their parents that the man was kidnapping her, and the people overreacted, and the man was brutally beaten. The cleanup was pretty simple to do. We secured windows, cleaned up blood and bodily fluid, but as soon as I entered the house, I just felt wave after wave of fear and sadness, like I have never felt this before, and it hit waves that made my legs weak. My working buddy, who was there, showed up late, and didn't get the story from the cops like I did, but experienced the same feelings. The whole time we were there, we saw a form darting around the corners like it was watching us, then hiding, similar to a small bit of fog or mist. We also heard very slight cries for help coming from several areas in the house, and also what sounded like, please stop. No. A few times the crowd came back and yelled at the house. And when this was going on, the activity in the house increased, and we could hear running footsteps going up the stairs and a door slam. It sounded like the front door would open and close, but we never saw any of the doors move. The path of the footsteps sounded like from the front door through the living room to the bathroom, to stairs to the upstairs bungalow room. The part that really got me was I could feel the floor impacts that felt like the vibrations of someone running past me when I was cleaning the areas. And each time I would be hit by one of those waves of fear or sadness. When we left the house, there were a few people on the porches hanging out, like as usual during summer and the people were still hostile and yelling random things, but directed at us as we loaded the van and took off the hazmat suits. We ignored this, but before we had loaded all the material from the house into the van and locked the house, the front door slammed hard enough to sound like a gunshot, which scared me and my crew member, along with the people on the front porch, to the point where they went inside. The front door deadbolt was somehow locked, and we could not get it open. I think it was a different key than the knob, so we ended up leaving several boards in the house that were left over from boarding a few of the windows. The feeling of relief when I left the house was like night and day. Inside I was anxious, scared and paranoid and just really down, which could be due to knowing the story, but when I got out, I felt like I was flipping a light switch. Immediately I felt better and me and the other guy in my crew were joking and laughing about dumb stuff, as normal 19 and 20 year olds do. I have many more stories of this written down in a journal I started after the first three months of working. I spoke to the other guys in the crew, and got the other strange stories from them too. I know that some of this could very well be formed by my subconscious mind to try and cope with traumatic situations, but some of it has no explanation. And when I hear other members of my crew tell me their stories when they haven't been influenced by mine, that is a horse of a different color. When I have time, I will put out the journal and give more experiences, the way the job got worse, and when I started the journal three months in, several experiences with what I think was paranormal, and many situations that stressed my mental state to the point where my mask of sanity began to slip. In the end, I worked for the place for almost two years, and of my crew, all died, two from suicide, and one from a drug overdose that could have been intentional, but we will never know. I just know that when these three guys my age, around 19 and 20, started this job, we were all normal, well-adjusted guys with no cares in the world other than girls and parties and working. I watched each of them slowly drain their joys and passions for life, and I know this sounds bad, but each one that died was considerate enough to die in a clean way, most likely so another person wouldn't have to see the horrible things that we all saw far too often. This happened to a friend a few years back. Back then we had a habit of going for walks at night, 
by my dorm school. He didn't live very far, so after walking me back, he walked home through a newly built park connector that took about half hour to get to his area. This was past midnight and I was chilling in my dorm room when he called and sounded really freaked out. He rambled that he'd been walking for close to an hour and hadn't reached any of the landmarks that the signs along the path mentioned. The whole X meters until some road, etc. The whole area was empty and even the houses lining the park were quiet and dark and there was no noise, crickets, animals, anything. After a while on the call, he told me he finally exited into a road into a neighborhood he didn't recognize. It was still empty, but there was a taxi at the side of the road. The car was running after peeking in and there was no one in it. He continued walking and after a bit, the taxi suddenly slowly drove off. Long story short, he eventually ended at the main road. I didn't think he was making it up because he's not the sort to do so. He went back to the area again and actually encountered something. I forgot the details of what happened there, but he managed to take a picture. What it looked like was a shadow figure, human shaped silhouette melting into the ground. It was certainly very strange. This happened about two years ago. One day after work, about five, me and a girl I worked with decided to go see a movie. It was a rough shift, and her and I felt like a movie would be nice. She asked if we could stop by her house so she could change clothes from our work uniform. I said it was fine since it was maybe five minutes away tops. We stayed at her house for a bit, ate a quick snack, then got in my car. She asked if we could stop by the gas station by her house so she could grab a Red Bull. Once again, I was fine with that because it was near her house. I drove to the gas station and the only parking was on the side of an abandoned car wash next to the gas station. To form a better image, the gas station and car wash were right next to each other, both entrances facing the same way. It was entirely dark outside. The gas station was a fairly run down one and didn't have any lights at the gas pumps like most do. So it was pitch black except for the light coming from my car. A semi truck was on the other side of the gas station and had cones indicating the area that would inhibit the driver to do what he needed. So I assumed the parking spots wouldn't be too close and I parked. My friend got out and went inside and I decided to stay in the car since she would only be a few minutes. I locked my doors after she got out as it was a force of habit to do so. I went on my phone for a bit and after a few minutes I saw a light flash on the driver's side mirror of my car. I turned to look since it was pointing in my direction. The truck driver had a flashlight pointing at my window and just held it there for a few seconds. I was kind of freaked out, but assumed he had a reason for doing so. He then began walking towards my window, still with the flashlight on. And I rolled my window down no more than an inch, assuming maybe he was just going to tell me to move my car. He stopped when he got two to three feet away from my window and just turned around. At this point, I was pretty scared, just because there was no reason for what he did. So I rolled my window back up and waited for my friend. I'm still watching the guy just in case and I see him rummaging around in the front part of his semi for a bit. Then he stopped and turned back to my car. There was something in his hand. I'm not sure what, and I'm glad I don't know. He began walking towards my window. He was saying something and it was in a rather loud volume, but inaudible. He got to my door this time and tried to open it. He tried to pull the handle a few times, but he couldn't open it, then started to pull more aggressively. My friend came out the gas station and was walking towards my car and she looked scared. I was scared. The guy saw her coming to my car and walked back to his truck and I drove away as quickly as possible. I'm not entirely sure what happened or what was going to happen. The only theory my friend had was that maybe when he saw that I was a girl, the first time he had the flashlight, he assumed I'd be a good target for something. That's just a theory though. I'm glad I won't ever have to find out what he was doing. I was probably around 10 or so, and I think this happened in 91. I lived in a rural area and my elementary school was on the street 
over, and I rode my bike there and sometimes played. One day when I was riding home, I noticed a white van, similar to a 1990 Ford E150 cargo van, had matched speed with me. I'm a kid in a bike. I'm not going near the speed limit, so I know something's weird. I try to think of a plan of what to do because I'm in trouble. So I start pedaling as fast as I can and the van speeds up to me. Luckily, I'm at the end of a street and turn left, cross a bridge, left again, and one of my friends lived on the first house of that street. His dad was home with the garage open, so that was good. I remember his dad wondering what was up. He seemed concerned but didn't ask. Just said that my friend wasn't home, as I briefly look over my shoulder and see the van continue past me. I went inside to use the restroom, but really I just needed to relax. The whole event from noticing the van pulling up was probably two minutes or less. I didn't get a good look at the driver at all, and that's the part that bothers me in hindsight. I think I didn't want the driver to know I noticed him or he may react. I didn't tell my parents either, or they probably wouldn't let me ride my bike out. But it ended up that I didn't feel safe riding my bike anyway. There were no reports of child abductions that I heard about, so hopefully it was just a misunderstanding. Or did I avoid a grim fate and the driver was too scared to try again? This next story is one of my personal favorites to share since everything turned out all right, but I still get chills thinking about how many different ways the night could have gone wrong. Allow me to elaborate. A few years ago, my friend Jane and I took a trip to Portland, Oregon. We're both from the south side of Chicago, and Jane was feeling pretty jaded with the city. She was convinced everything was better on the west coast, including the people. So we flew out to Portland and rented a car, which we called Veronica. The day before we were supposed to fly back home, we took Veronica and drove up to Aberdeen, Washington to see Kurt Cobain's childhood home. After that, we drove down the coast, sightseeing along the way. We visited Astoria, Oregon to see the house from the Goonies and ended the day at Cannon Beach to check out Haystack Rock. All in all, it was a pretty nice day. Once it started to get dark, we decided to head back to our hotel, which is just under two hours away. I knew that I needed gas, so I told Jane I would stop at the first gas station I saw. Cannon Beach is a small resort type town. There are a lot of little shops and restaurants, but I didn't see any gas stations. Being from the city, I'm used to seeing two on every corner, so I wasn't really worried. I expected to find one soon. I am completely unfamiliar with the area, so I just keep following the GPS's instructions while talking to Jane. Next thing I know, we're not in any type of town, we're on a dark winding road surrounded by trees. At this point I'm getting a little worried. I pull over to the side of the road and use the GPS to search for the nearest gas station. It tells me there's one about a mile down the road. Awesome. I'll get some gas and we'll be set. So I'm driving and Veronica tells us that we arrived at our destination. I pull into a completely dark and empty gas station. We're still surrounded by woods and darkness, and as far as I can tell, there's nothing around for miles. According to Veronica, we have about 10 miles worth of gas, and the nearest gas station from here is 30 miles away. Jane and I are sitting there trying to figure out what to do, when another car pulls in. I keep going about my business and don't really pay attention to the other car. I just assume they need gas too. When out of the corner of my eye, I see someone gesturing to me. After some hesitation, I crack the window to see what they want. There's a middle-aged man and his wife in the car. He starts asking us all kinds of questions. Need to fill up? Coming from the beach? Driving back to Portland? I keep my answers polite but short. Then he tells me he actually owns the gas station we were at, but that it doesn't make enough money to keep it open that late. He tells us he knows of a chevron about three miles away and gives us directions for it. 
He gave us his number and says to give him a call in case we don't make it to Chevron. His name was apparently Sam the Mechanic and wanted to know if we needed him to rescue us. We thanked him profusely and headed out. Jane is going on about how nice it was and that that would never happen in Chicago. I agreed. It was very nice and says, a lot of weirdos out here tonight. Jane and I look at each other and let out a small laugh. Ha, <laughs> told you. I turn back to the kid and ask him what he means. He tells me this story how his brother owes some drug dealer a ton of money and how he's hiding somewhere nearby. He's planning on kicking the crap out of him once he gets off his shift. I can tell Jane is getting uncomfortable with the building weirdness of the night. So I give the kid a decent tip, wish him luck and start driving again. At one point during our conversation, Jane calls Sam the mechanic man and leaves him a voicemail. She tells him we made it to the gas station and how much we appreciate his help. I thought the call was unnecessary, but it is what it is. A few minutes later, we're on the highway and about 10 minutes from our hotel, Jane's phone rings. It's Sam. Again, she thanks him profusely. He asks her where from and when we're flying home. He tells her his name is Sam Glesty and he wrote a book called Wrongly Accused and that we should read it while on our plane ride home. This piqued my interest. Jane, you have to look the book up to see what it's about. She Googles it and then she makes a face that looks like she's about to puke. What is it? He was accused of being the Green River Killer. Immediately, she starts freaking out because he now has her number. Back at the hotel, we do more digging. Apparently, a victim of the Green River serial killer picked Sam out of a lineup. However, the real killer was caught and convicted based on DNA evidence. But around the same time in the 70s, Sam was convicted and served time for abducting and assaulting a young woman in the area we were in. The book he wrote was all about that. We ended up stuck in Portland for two more days due to a snowstorm in Chicago. It was a weird, tension-filled two days. Considering the circumstances and weirdness of the night, things could have gone horribly wrong. I'm glad all I got out of that night was a story of a near miss. This happened to my ex-stepbrother, 16 or more years ago. When I was around 13, my dad had taken a job in another state about four hours away. He would stay in an apartment during the week and would come home on his weekends off. A few years later, my older stepbrother, around 17 at the time, began seeing what he claimed was an old woman around our local home. She would never do anything malicious, but she only presented herself to him. It would often be times when he was home alone. This went on for a few months. Nothing more than your typical, what do you want, conversations. He said she would speak to him, most times saying that she was getting taller and mundane statements like that. One night, while me, my younger stepbrother and stepmother were visiting my father, we get a call from my older stepbrother. He was frantically telling my dad that he needed to get his hunting rifles out of his truck and lock them up inside. The odd part here is that my dad never left hunting rifles in his vehicle. At first, my dad shrugged it off, thinking maybe he had just mentioned in passing that he had left them in there in that morning. Then he started to wonder why he would be calling so late and why he sounded so panicky. While my dad went out to recover the guns, my stepmother asked what Brandon, the older stepbrother's problem was. He said that the old lady had woken him, telling him that Randy, my dad, needed to get the guns into the house. She apparently told him that if he didn't, Brian, my younger stepbrother, was going to get hurt. After this, my stepbrother never spoke of the woman again. We assume she never came back. A more heartwarming tale involves my ex-stepmother's mum. She was dying of lung cancer, and while she was in hospice care, she would stare out the window and watch hummingbirds feed from a dispenser just outside the window. The day of her funeral, a pure white hummingbird hung around the flowers at the head of her casket for the entire service.
This happened around eight to nine years ago. My husband and I are driving back from Michigan as we went to visit my parents. And by the time we get into the remote back area of Ohio, it's dark. Dark being around 12 a.m. when we get into the backwoods. And by the time we hit the small towns, it was around 1 or 2 a.m. We always make sure our doors are locked because we aren't stupid. Anyway, we make a quick stop to use the restrooms, stretch and get something to drink. We get back on the road and we're going along and we slow down to stop for a road sign. And this woman walks out right in front of us and I slam on the brakes to keep from hitting her. We sit there for a minute collecting ourselves and think, what the hell? She knocks on the passenger side window where my husband's sitting and I tell him to not roll it down and to let's just get the hell out of here. But he, being the kind-hearted guy he is, rolls down his window. She tells us that she'd been walking for hours and that her car broke down. She can't get a hold of her daughter and that she has no money and needs $50 for a cab. Quite specific, right? He tells her to hold on, rolls up the window, and I'm telling him, no, you've got to be nuts. Do not let her in this truck. And he gives me this spiel that she needs help and stuff. Hate me all you like, but I learned the hard way to never trust people, especially strangers. And I told him that I didn't give a flying monkeys if she were bleeding on the ground. She was not getting in my truck. He guilts me into letting her in. Now I'm driving a Ford F-150 and there's only one seat. So we're all crammed and I ask her where she's going. She says to a store, then says she needs to find a cab but has no money and if we can give her 50 bucks. I'm silently telling my husband, like hell are we giving her money as we're driving her, but relents and says yes. We drive and she's telling us all kinds of stories about her, her daughter, how she needs to get home, how her daughter's 16 at home alone, that it's about two hours away in Ohio. The more we drive, the more it changes. I ask her about her daughter and this time, She's in her late twenties, has a few kids and is in Kentucky. I said, oh, I thought she was 16 home alone and two hours away in Ohio. She says, oh, that's my younger daughter. It's my adult daughter I'm gonna see. Uh, okay, that makes no damn sense. She just said she came from Kentucky. We find an ATM and thankfully it's broken. We push on to find another and the more she talks, the weirder she gets. She tries cozying up to my husband and sweet talking him. And he is oblivious to women hitting on him. So she moves on to me and I refuse to accept it by constantly changing the subject. Then it gets stranger. She says, are you two married? We reply, yes. Oh, that's good. Because I would have had to call Jesus down to smite you if you were living in sin. We were both thinking, what? Then says, you two are a very nice Christian couple. And we both reply, we're not Christian. She gets upset by this and starts spouting the Bible at us and the hubby is retorting back at her. We finally reach another ATM and this entire time, the hubby and I have been communicating through signals that we need to get the nut job out the car. We pull up and he says, I need to get out of the car to get to the ATM. And she says, just have your wife pull up and use it. He says, no. No one uses my card but me. Then she goes, have your wife get out. And he replies, her door's broken and only the passenger door works, which is a lie of course, but we needed to get her out. She gets out and he grabs the door to pull it closed. And she grabs the door and starts screaming at us to let her back in. As she's trying to get back in, he says to her, no, your story's full of holes and doesn't add up. She pulls out this knife assuming like a switchblade and my husband shoves her and I peel out of the bank parking lot with the door still open. He shuts it and locks it. She chases us screaming that she's gonna kill us and I floor it, pushing the gas pedal to the floor and we're doing 120 and don't let up for four miles until my husband is screaming, slow down, you're gonna kill us. I do and I'm shaking part due to anger and part due to being freaked the hell out. We made our home safely, but crazy lady that tried to rob us and stab my husband. Let's never meet again.
I was driving my car alone a few years back when I heard a loud voice other than my own in my head say, stop the car now. I was going 60 on the highway, but I checked my mirrors and saw that I was free to slam on my brakes. As I did, two cars with no headlights on came careening down the road on either side of me, going 100 plus. They then met in the middle and crashed into each other a few car lengths in front of me. If I hadn't have slowed down to almost stop, I would have certainly been a part of the mess. By the looks of it, they were racing or messing with one another, and they had no headlights on in the dark of night. They were in both lanes on either side of me, and then egged on each other a second or two more in front of me before they both decided to swerve in the center lane in front of me, maybe trying to fake each other out at the same time, I'm not sure. They were both sent into ditches on either side of me. I did not stop, but I saw many people in front of and behind me pull over. The adrenaline was really something. Their behavior had really freaked me out as well. So I just kept driving home. I'm sorry if that wasn't the right thing to do, but I know others did stop. Every summer, with a few friends, we take a trip to the seaside of France for about a week. Last year, we decided to go to Hossega on the southwestern coast for surfing, but ended up in a small touristic village called Moliet Emma, an hour from where we were supposed to be because of a messed up reservation. The week was going okay until the last three days of the trip. So the past two days, we had been in trouble with the police and a few other tourists because of some misunderstandings over a pack of cigarettes. We had spent the last two nights stressing and trying to cool off, and therefore we thought the last night we spent there wasn't going to be as bad as those two. And it couldn't possibly be, as we were leaving the next day very early in the morning. So we had only planned to go to a restaurant for dinner with some friends that we had met there to celebrate the trip. The dinner was going great. We were all having fun, and as time passed by, it started to get dark. Towards the end of the meal, my best friend Dennis, who was driving us home the next day, thought it would be best for him to leave early and not drink too much so that he could sleep as soon as possible and be in the best shape for the long drive that was coming. He left about 15 minutes before the rest of the group. While we stayed and drank a bit more, we paid with the check. And as soon as I got up from my chair, I received a message from Dennis. Call me. There's a guy following me. Here's what happened. Dennis had to pass through a caravan parking lot and a golf to get back to the residence in which we had rented a house. While he was in the parking lot, he noticed someone behind him that was about one meter seven, roughly his size, with a hood and a cap on it. At first, he didn't think anything of him as the village was actually quite touristic and there were a lot of people usually passing by the car park. But when Dennis stopped to pee on a tree, he had a glimpse of the guy behind him stopping and hiding behind another tree a few feet back. As soon as he got walking again, the guy stepped out from behind the tree and started following him again against the gulf. As Dennis got there, he was a bit creeped out, especially since at night the gulf is completely dark and only illuminated by moonlight. It is completely devoid of people and he stopped again for a second time to light a cigarette and check if the guy was still behind him. Once again, the guy stepped out of the path and hid behind a tree, until Dennis started walking again. That's when he understood he was in danger. This guy wasn't physically imposing, and so Dennis thought it was weird. He was so confident in following him, maybe because he was holding onto a knife or gun. Nevertheless, Dennis kept walking and acting as if he hadn't noticed anything. Although the guy was following him again and sent me the message, call me, there's a guy following me. As soon as I picked up, he spoke loudly to try and scare off the guy. Hey, you're at the golf with the other eight? No problem, I'll be there in a minute. Even though we were five and absolutely no way near the golf, it was terrifying for me. But it was clever because it made me understand he wasn't joking and where he was. 
I swore to him that everything was going to be okay and that I would be there in five and told him to be careful and try and get home safely. As soon as I hung up, I began running towards where he was and explained very briefly to my friend that Dennis was in trouble and that we had to get there ASAP. Meanwhile, when I hung up, Dennis put the phone back in his pocket and kept walking. He took a glance back and saw the guy that was still a few meters behind him. He took a last puff of the cigarette he had lit two minutes before and threw it to the ground and began running towards the residence. As he was running, he took a look back and saw the guy began running too. The chase lasted five minutes before he got in front of our house, which was empty. When he got there, he stopped for a second, looked back, and the guy was 10 meters behind him, in the middle of the alley, immobile, and then went to hide behind one of the cars that were on the side of it. As soon as Dennis saw that, he panicked, barged into the house, locked the door with difficulty, and grabbed the biggest knife he could, and waited on the couch, facing the entrance to the house, which was a glass canopy. When me and my friends got there, he was scared but unhurt, and he explained everything to us. We then went looking for the guy. The neighbors hadn't seen anyone other than us. And even though we got to the residence at first in separate groups at different times and through the two different entrances, we didn't see anyone coming out of them. He had completely vanished. Nothing was stolen even though we had left clothes to dry outside and nobody was hurt. So we didn't call the police but warned the neighbors and me and two others stayed up all night outside as lookouts for the guy, as he had seen where we lived, and we were afraid he'd return during the night. Dennis had been lucky. We never knew what were the intentions of the guy, or if he was hiding something that gave him the advantage over my friend. Furthermore, he didn't even try to get into the house, and good for Dennis because there was another entrance to the house, another glass canopy that led out to one of our friend's rooms, which had not been closed correctly. We couldn't even understand why he did that. Did he want to steal from Dennis? Or maybe something worse? We didn't call the cops back then, because of the trouble we'd had with them over the past two days, and the problem with the pack of cigarettes. Also, after those three days had gone wrong, we just wanted it to end and go home and sleep. I regret not calling them now, but it's too late, and I hope the guy hasn't creeped on anyone since. One day about three years ago, I was at my house with my younger sister and our friend. We were about 20 to 21 years old, all females. We were hungry and decided to go out and grab some sushi. On the way to the restaurant, I noticed I was low on gas, so I stopped to get some. I pulled up to the pump and parked the car. I went into the gas station to pay while my sister and our friend waited in the car. As I was walking across the parking lot into the store, I noticed a man staring at me with a creepy smirk on his face. We made eye contact and he yelled across the parking lot, Hey beautiful, why aren't you smiling? I didn't respond or even acknowledge him. However, a young woman who witnessed this said to him, Do not tell her to smile. She doesn't have to do anything for you. To this day, I think about that woman. I thanked her and continued to walk into the store. As I stood patiently in the line, the same man walked in, came right over to me in the line and started to touch me. He was rubbing my arm and lower back and I pulled away and said loudly, Get away from me. I don't know you. Don't touch me or I'll defend myself. Other customers and the cashier were watching us as I caused a scene. He whispered in my ear and told me to shut up so people didn't think he's a creep. Suddenly the man ran out the store and to my car with my sister and friend still in it. I ran after him. He opened the car door and started to say something to them when I yanked him back so hard from his shirt collar and punched him in the face. He proceeded to of course call me some lovely things and every other name in the book, but he left us alone and got in his car and drove away. I'm much more aware of my surroundings now. To the creepy gas station man, let's not meet again. Back in 2001, 
I left for college and my family moved into a house on a lake. My younger siblings were kids at the time and claimed they would see handprints appear along the wall in the downstairs hallway. So they generally avoided hanging out there. Since I never really lived in the house after college, I completely forgot about it. Fast forward to this past November. COVID-19 is raging, so I flew back home to be with my parents since the bi-level house allowed me to quarantine for two weeks downstairs. During my isolation, I started to feel a really deep gratitude that we had this house right now that allowed me to be with my family safely. I would periodically walk up and down the hallway, placing my hand along the walls and saying a little thank you prayer. It was maybe the third or fourth time I did this, when I suddenly remembered the story of the handprints from years ago. Pretty interstellar, if you ask me. Coweta, Oklahoma, a small, quaint and haunted town, it was Indian Territory, and I lived in three different houses there in different parts of town as a little girl and experienced many supernatural things. There is a lot of history and a lot of old buildings and homes in Kowessa. The first house I lived in was right across from some woods. My three siblings and I used to play there, and one day we decided to go in further than we had before. I was about four years old, and we found an old dilapidated shack. As we got closer to it, the leaves to my left flew up and almost in a straight line like they would for a sudden gust of wind, but there was no wind. It stopped right in front of me. And then there was a very loud and deep man's voice all around us that just screamed, get out. Needless to say, we ran like hell. I was the youngest and smallest and the first one out of there. After this, I would see an old man at the edge of the woods he would stay there like he was guarding them. My mother asked me one day why I was afraid of the woods, and I told her it was because of the bad man. She inquired further. I told her that there was a bad man that didn't want us on the woods anymore, but she brushed it off, and life went on. We moved away for a couple of years until my parents divorced. My mother moved us into a small two-bedroom house that was closer to our school. She was sleeping on the fold-out couch, and us kids had the two bedrooms. It was also right next to a cemetery, and we would play there too, as curious children often do. There was always a man, probably in his early thirties, that would visit his mother's grave often. He was there every time we went, no matter what time it was. He'd pack food and camp out, talking away at the grave all day. We were intrigued. We would hide behind the gravestones and try to hear what he was saying. I don't remember being able to make anything out, but his facial expressions and body movements were so casual, like there was something sitting in front of him, keeping up the banter. One day, my oldest brother and I managed to get really close. We thought we were slick. All of a sudden, the man stood up, turned around, looked right at us and said, What are you looking at, kid? And then started speaking in different voices in a language we didn't understand. It sounded like gibberish. It is possible he was messing with us, but it was certainly creepy, and I stopped going to the area after that. After another short time, we ended up moving into downtown Coeta. It was literally one street with a small building neatly aligned on either side. We lived on a side street that was once a cemetery back when the town was first settled in 1840. When they decided to build houses, they moved all the graves. Well, I found out through my lack of supervision in 1990 and constant curiousness that they built houses on top of graves. There were gravestones in the crawl space of at least three homes. There was a very old white two-storied house that sat one block from our house. We saw multiple families move in and out only a few months later. The house was empty almost most of the time and my oldest brother and myself and Cat climbed into the crawl space. My cat was awesome, and we attempted to turn a stone over so we could try and read it with our flashlight. As we did, something hissed, and this wasn't a normal animal sound, it was like a hundred voices all hissing at once at different frequencies. The hair all over my body stood up, and we freaked out. My brother was out first, my cat second. As I got to the sidewalk, I saw my cat get picked up and thrown. Someone grabbed my cat and pulled me to the ground. I was so scared I started crying, and my cat hid in my mum's closet and wouldn't come out until the next day. 
I ended up having a giant bruise on my right butt cheek, and it was hard for me to even walk past the house after that. In this same house with the graves in the crawl space, I would often see an old woman. I wasn't the only one that saw her, but I did see her more than others. I mostly saw her at night, but there would even be times during the day she'd be there too. At night, I'd often wake up to her standing by my dresser, which was just in front of the door. She was illuminated by the whole light my mum would leave on for us, and would just stare and move her mouth, but I couldn't hear her. On three or four occasions, she would put her hands on my crayons that were on the dresser. The next day, they'd be moldy and dried up. I have no idea why she would do that, but she did. And my mum just kept replacing them, but still never believed me. Also, things would turn on and off by themselves. There'd be footsteps, whispers, doorknobs rattling. All in all, I had a terrifying childhood in Coweta, Oklahoma. To preface this, I love to drive. Long hour drives to nowhere with no destination in mind. Just me, my music, and the road ahead of me. Living in Nebraska, I'd often take back roads or lonely highways cutting through the countryside to small towns and eventually cities. And I'd like to usually take these drives at night since there was much less traffic to worry about. I've done it since I've had my license for the past four or five years and I've never once had any sort of issue, nor run into any trouble of any sort. This was until a few nights ago. For reference, I'm a relatively small 22-year-old female, and as I've stated before, I often take these drives completely and utterly alone. They're a good way to clear my head when I'm stressed, upset, or overwhelmed, or for me to get a plan together or sort out personal issues. I've also done these long and lonely drives to get away from the toxicity of my household when I used to live with my parents as a mean of coping with their alcoholism. Though now that I've moved out and I'm in a much better place mentally, I don't really have the urge to get in my car and just drive anymore. However, on the night this event took place, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed, stressed and anxious with a cluster of personal issues I'd rather not get into. I felt restless and irritable around my boyfriend and couldn't focus on anything else and decided I needed a drive to clear my head. My boyfriend was understanding and told me to be careful and to not be gone for too terribly long since it was getting pretty late. I agreed, gave him a kiss goodbye and left. I drove around our city for about 30 minutes but I was still feeling on edge about everything transpiring in my personal life, so I decided to drive further north, down those familiar, dark, winding one-lane highways. I kept the car at a steady 65 miles per hour, taking the turns at a slower pace in case a deer jumped out around the bend and was just admiring the vast, empty darkness of the snow-capped fields and barren trees. It was honestly a bit creepy being all alone with no cars in sight in seemingly the middle of nowhere. The few houses I'd seen were now miles back. The road, lightless, and the dead cornfields withered away and were covered in snow. It was like something out of a horror movie, and I half expected to see a ghost pop up my rearview mirror or see someone clamber out from the patches of trees dotting the horizon. The only light came from my headlight, and even then, I still strained to see through the inky darkness of the night. By now it was just after 11, and I told myself that once I made the familiar roundabout that would either take you to a small town or back towards the city, I would head back towards the city and home. The roundabout was still 15 to 25 minutes away, but other than my imagination picturing the worst, I wasn't really at all concerned. I mean, I was by myself, but I didn't have any other motorists to worry about, right? Wrong. As I round another bend, I notice a vehicle with its hazards flashing maybe a quarter of a mile or something away from me. It was some sort of sedan, dark colored, and was angled to where only part of it was on the shoulder, while the rest was jutted out on the road, like they had to pull over in a hurry, but didn't quite manage to do it. The driver's side door was flung wide open 
and as I slowed my vehicle down and angled it towards the opposite side of the road to pass, I could make out what looked like maybe blood on the inside of the open door. I didn't see anyone on the road or in the car, and I was the only motorist in sight. The cell phone reception was spotty at best in this part of the country, but more often than not, you couldn't get reception no matter how hard you prayed, which was definitely the case when I took a glance at my phone to see if I had any service. So a lone female on the road at night, pulling up near a vacant vehicle that looks like someone had been attacked on or inside of, with no cell service. Now I'm no dummy. I've watched countless episodes of Investigation Discovery and Criminal Minds and read far too many true crime books to know that this had bad and danger written all over it. But there was a still small part of me that was worried something terrible had happened to whomever was in that vehicle. And I thought I needed to help. These roads didn't get a lot of traffic late at night and temperatures were well below freezing. If someone were hurt or in trouble, there was no one and nothing else to help them but me. Still, I erred on the side of caution. I was still driving my car, though a bit more slowly. And as I approached the vehicle, I rolled down my passenger window a bit, shut off the music and called out. Hey, anyone there? You okay? I didn't hear a response. I worried they were passed out somewhere, but I wasn't about to get out and look for them. I told myself I'd call out one last time, and if I didn't hear anything, I would leave, and the moment there was reception, I'd call it in. And if I did hear someone, well, then I'd get to that bridge when I came to it. So I shouted again. Hey, what happened? Are you okay? There was silence for a beat. Then I heard rustling in the shadows of the trees, followed by a gruff voice saying, Yeah? I was relieved at first. I was about to say something in response, or possibly even stop my car and get out, when I noticed three things simultaneously. As I inched my way past the front of the sedan, I noticed there was no damage to the hood or anywhere else on the vehicle, which I found to be strange considering the blood on the inside of the door. In my rear view mirror, I caught a glance of someone coming out from behind the sedan, and they were making their way towards my car fast. The person did not have any blood on them, nor appeared injured in any way, wearing a mask, not like a face mask for COVID or ski mask or anything normal, but one of those masks you could see being used in the Purge movies, and they were holding something in their hand. I don't know what it was, I didn't get a good enough look, but from its length and shape, my best guess would be a tire iron or a crowbar. I don't even need to say that I slammed on the gas at that very moment and drove like a bat out of hell, my heart thundering in my chest and my entire body shaking. My window was still rolled down in my haste and the music was still shut off, so I could very clearly hear someone, definitely a man, shouting at me, though I had no clue what they were saying. I just knew I had to get out of there immediately. I stole one last look in my rearview mirror as I drove away mostly to see if they were getting in their sedan to follow Chase or if they had stopped. The man with the weapon was still standing in the middle of the road watching me, and right before I looked away from the mirror, I saw a second man emerge from the trees that had been rustling earlier, also wearing one of those creepy masks and no trace of blood on him. I probably broke every law for speeding that night, but wanted to get away from those men as quickly as possible. As soon as I made it to the roundabout, I turned towards town, parked in a Walmart parking lot that thankfully still had cars in it from who I assumed were workers closing up shop and proceeded to have a full-on meltdown. When I could pull myself together, I called one of my friends who was a police officer to tell him what happened and asked what I should do. He was concerned for me after asking if I was okay, where I was and if they followed. He told me since it was out of the city limits, he couldn't do much on his end but he could get in contact with the local police sheriff in that jurisdiction to take my statement and check it out. I agreed and thanked him, and while I waited for police to show up, I called my boyfriend. Through my hysterical sobs and panic, I managed to tell him what happened, not even 10 minutes or so ago. He was, as you can imagine, super freaked for my safety and wanted me to either come home immediately or drive down himself to take me home. 
I told him the police were on their way to take my statement, so I couldn't leave and that I was okay. But I stayed on the phone with him until I saw the familiar police cruiser pulling into the lot. I gave the police my statement, and they assured me they would go back to the spot I told them the sedan had been to to take a look, and they would try and catch the guys who did it. Though with no cameras and no description of the men, I wasn't sure they'd be able to. I didn't even get the license plate number. Though at the time of my panic, the thought never came to me until the police were asking if I got it. All they had to go off of was guys in a dark colored sedan wearing masks. After I gave my statement, I went home and stayed curled up close to my boyfriend the whole night, listening to every sound the house made in fear it would be those guys arriving any minute to finish whatever they had started. Since the incident, I haven't heard back from police about whether or not they had any leads. I'm not sure they ever will. I'm just thankful I'm still here and that I didn't stop to get out my car because I'm not sure what would have happened if I did. I still have so many questions that have no answers. What were they doing? Why? What was the blood on the inside of their car? Was it a ruse to get more attention? Or was it really blood? Did they hurt someone? What would have happened to me if I'd have stopped my car? Needless to say, I won't be going on any late night drives to anywhere for a while. And I hope I never cross paths with those freaks again. I was an EMT working the 4am to 4pm shift. We pick up our rig and get told to post, hang out and wait for a call in a really crappy part of town. I parked behind this shopping centre where all of the businesses had closed down due to the lack of people around the general area. It was a lot of trailer parks, really run down apartments and whatnot. And I picked this place because the sun is going to rise in an hour or so. And my partner and I both wanted to take a nap until a call came through that radioed to us. My partner has no problem sleeping while sitting straight up in front of the ambulance. But I absolutely can't do this. So I went in the back and lied down on the bench trying to nap. The thing about our old ambulance is that you couldn't open the side door from the inside. So I had to get out, go through the side door, not the very back double doors, and I lay down. I left the side door a little bit cracked open for when a call came in so that I could just jump out and respond. But about five minutes of me laying there, I hear my partner call me. Hey dude, you're awake? Yeah, why? That person over there has been staring at us for a while. Across the street, there was a sidewalk along the side of a park. I could make out a faint shadow of a person. I knew it was someone because their cigarette butt flickered every time they took a puff. The street light was super dim, but I could tell that they were there, just staring at us. It was super weird, so we watched them for a bit. And after about five more minutes of us just watching, the person walks away. We joke about how weird people are, being up at 5 a.m. roaming around some sketchy park. And I lay back down and begin dozing off. I wake up to my partner yelling, holy crap, dude. So I pop my head up into the front cabin. The person was standing about 20 feet from our ambulance, dressed in all black, just staring at him, eyes locked. I look at her face and I kid you not, she looked like the girl from the ring. She had pitch black straight hair, wearing all black, very light skinned, And the street light made her look like she was as white as paper. My partner is absolutely terrified as they've entered some sort of weird staring match and I told him to hop over into the driver's seat and to get the hell out of there. He says that he couldn't. He's too scared to move. Crap. I guess I have to squeeze back from the back through this little space to get into the driver's seat. I jump up and try and get back into the front cabin. It's a tight squeeze because I'm a bigger guy, but I make it through and she apparently takes note of me moving and begins power walking straight to us. I've never been so freaked out in my life. As she gets super close, I realize she's looking at the side door that I left cracked a little bit. And I'm thinking, I forgot to close it. I get a good look at her. She noticed the door and I think she's gonna try and get in. Is she gonna try and kill us? I don't know, but I've got to get out of there. Her whole body is shaking as she gets closer and closer, still staring at my partner. She gets up right next to the window and just stares at us both. 
I get into the front, with about one second to spare, start the ambulance and peel out of there. And we never posted there again. When I was a child, I was always stricken by this irrational fear that when I went outside at night, I had to walk straight into the house without looking back. Because if I looked back, someone would be following me. One day after dinner, I went out to the car to get my book back. I was continuing my ritual of walking straight inside without looking back. Adrenaline pumping, anxiety going full force, and I just stopped and said to myself, this is stupid, and I made myself look back. When I looked back, I saw what appeared to be someone crouched down behind my mum's car, peeking their head around. They were just staring and smiling. It appeared to be a woman between her 30s and 40s with curly blonde hair. We made eye contact for a second, and then she ducked behind the car where I couldn't see her. I stood frozen for a second and then ran inside. I told my mum, and she went outside to check, but of course no one was there. My mum didn't exactly not believe me, but she wasn't very concerned either. Let me take you back to one of the creepiest encounters I've had in my life. For reference, 25-year-old female here. I'd like to set the scene. This happened eight years ago. I was living in a dingy little motel with my mother in a terrible area in Metro Atlanta. The motel was full of the types of folks you'd expect to see there. You had your pimps, you had your ladies of the night, and you had a couple of dealers, but you mostly saw their clientele. I personally was never bothered. It was what it was, and 17-year-old me liked to think of myself as a mini gangster, despite being a whopping five foot three and 110 pounds, but I wasn't worried. So here I am hanging out at the motel with my boyfriend one lovely dark winter night. We were both antsy and bored out our minds, so decided to take a walk on the gas station across the street for some cigarillos. Sure, it's late, but the gas station is only across the street. What can happen between here and there? I forgot to mention previously that directly in front of the right half of the hotel is a waffle house. Like you pretty much pull into Waffle House and drive past it just a tad to end up at the motel parking lot. I only mention it because the location matters a little. Anyway, so we set off. The boyfriend and I are arguing, so we barely even noticed when this woman popped out from behind the Waffle House building. But when we did notice, we instantly went silent. This large woman was stomping towards us. I don't mean large like overweight. I mean large as in everything. She was way taller than me and had at least half a foot on my boyfriend, who sat at 5'7". And sure, she was overweight too. I only mentioned her weight and height to help you understand that she was just a really big lady, which made her quite intimidating. When she approached us, her face twisted in a way that looked both angry and confused, and I wasn't feeling very G anymore. As I stood in front of us, she just stared at us with that same face, eyes moving back and forth between my boyfriend and myself. So I take a step or two back behind my boyfriend when this lady finally speaks. Where's the crack? I couldn't tell if it was a question or a demand. Either way, we didn't have any. And we told her that. You're lying. I know some of you have some. No, we don't. We told her that again, but she was becoming increasingly angry as we kept repeating that we didn't have any. So finally, I'm like, look, lady, we don't have any crack. Try the other side of the hotel. I bet there's someone with some over there. I felt like it was sound advice because we really didn't have anything. And someone likely would have it over there. I just wanted her to leave, but I guess that bothered her more. Because as we started to retreat towards the store, she screams at us, how would you know, unless you have it? Once she said that, I realized there was no convincing her that we truly did not have any crack. So we noped out of there. I was nervous about walking back, but you gotta do what you gotta do. And fortunately for us, she was nowhere in sight. 
So we locked ourselves in my room, put the cigarillo to good use while we laughed about what happened, and I assumed she went to the other side and found what she was looking for. And even better, I never saw her again. And to be clear, I do not judge with those addictions. As someone who has lost and almost lost family to it, I find it incredibly heartbreaking and place no judgment on those who get sucked into its spiral. I hope the woman ended up getting help and I hope the same for all the addicts out there. If that happens to be you, let me tell you this. You are strong and you can do it. You got this. But to the creepy lady demanding I give her my non-existent crack, I hope to never encounter you again. A few years ago, I went to a Christmas party. That night, my housemates went home earlier, while I decided to stay and get into the Christmas spirit with a few other friends. I ended up getting pretty hammered and got home around 3 a.m. But instead of going straight to bed, I got another beer inside and went out to the back porch to have a smoke and look at the stars. I was outside a few minutes when I see a light go on in the kitchen. My housemate comes out and looks at me out the back. I wave and generally look like a drunk idiot. I thought he was going to come out and get a debrief on the rest of the evening, as there were some good laughs we had irrelevant to the story. Anyway, he just gets a glass of water and goes to bed. I finish my beer and join him. The next morning we're rehashing the previous night when he mentions getting up and seeing me have a smoke out back. Who came back from the party with you? I give him a sideways look and reply, no one dude, I was out there alone. He insists, nah man, there was someone out there with you, behind you on the porch, when you were looking inside waving. I didn't come out because I thought it was going to be the random friend at the Christmas party I didn't know. I couldn't be bothered to make introductions. To this day, he stands by this version of the events. Whoever it was must have been standing nearby, because I saw no one and heard nothing. Gives me the willies each time I think about it. To this day, I still find this story very spooky, and I'm still perplexed and have no idea what happened. Let me share it to you. I had a lot of work-related sites, ranging from downtown Baltimore to Virginia Beach and all around. Friday wrapped up, and I hit the road to some local arrangements I'd made for the weekend. And I spent the weekend with friends out in various parts of Virginia, and got dragged off to other places even further out. The usual weekend fun times. It's late Sunday night when I have to leave or I'm not going to be able to get home to start my thankfully late afternoon on Monday. I'm fully rested, didn't do any drinking, and I'm not into drugs. On the highway about 3am, in the middle of nowhere between Roanoke and DC, with absolutely no one around, I'm cruising along in the left lane, simply because no one else is near me. No headlights for the past hour, no taillights either. No road lamps, it's dark, mildly damp, it's foggy, and I've got the music on loud. I'm feeling pretty good. All is fine. And then, I just happen to look to the left, and out there I see a dog barking at me. A German shepherd in a car passenger seat. Somewhat blue glow from the instruments inside the car, and it's got its face to the window and it's barking its head off at me. I get a good hard look at it too, because at first my brain is not registering that it's a cop car. I'm doing 95 plus in a 75, and probably have the oh crap moment when the dog, the instrument, the white crown Vic, the light bar, and all in my brain clicks, and after a second hard look I put my foot on the brakes and start slowing down hard but safe to pull over. I even put my blinkers on to start shifting lanes over to the right to pull over, because, wait, there's no hard shoulder on the left side of the road. I look back to my left, where there is still no shoulder room for the other car, and it's just gone, without a trace. I slammed on my brakes and stopped in the middle of the highway, flipped on all my light bars, even looked around me with my handheld spot. There was nothing. No taillights, no headlights, no engine sounds, not a damn thing. There were no other tire marks in the damp, mine, and I can see a nice long distance for both ways. 
complete emptiness. My vehicle had great visibility and a lot of extra lighting, as an off-road SUV with all the trimmings. There is no possible way someone pulled a sneaky, let alone drive that fast on wet, slopped grass and rocks on my left side. So, yeah. Cop Ghost and his dog didn't like me speeding, apparently. Ghosts, spirits, and other bodiless entities have been an interest of mine since childhood. Among the books I often checked out from the library in my hometown back in the day, ghost stories were a sure thing to be found in my stacks. The subject has always intrigued me, though I can honestly say, I never really expected to encounter any disembodied spirits myself. But boy was I wrong. Of all the unbelievable encounters that I've experienced over the years, ghosts, spirits, and shapeless entities have been a recurring thing. The first experience happened in 2012. That particular winter took a toll on my soul, it really did. Jess and I were renting an apartment located in a small town in East Tennessee. It wasn't the greatest of neighborhoods to say the least. There were lots of drugs in and out, for sure. The entire town was pretty bad as far as I was concerned, so there wasn't much to do for it. Anywhere you rented, an apartment was just as affiliated as the next. I was deep into my studies at the time, and struggled to find work due to an injury I had sustained the year before. I basically had way too much time on my hands for thinking, and everywhere I looked, I saw drugs. The little town of Tazewell was a cesspool of needles and melted down high-grade opiates. Out of the 20-something apartments in a one-block radius from mine, well over a dozen of them were heavy drug users, thieves, liars, cheats, conmen, or low to mid-level dealers. In the year that I lived in that apartment, there were three deaths by overdose. Needles were involved each time. It was a thick and sickly atmosphere to live in. One that I do not miss at all and hope to never be subjected to again. And now that the background has been put out of the way, let's get on to this story. It was early spring. My other half and I had both been managing a little pizza place down the road. I had just left the job a few weeks before I had this dream. Sometimes things in life happen that you can't accurately describe the importance of to others who didn't experience what was involved. This was one of those times. In my dream, I woke up in my apartment, and it looked exactly as it did in real life. I was in my bed, and so I sat up and looked around. There was a man nearby, and he looked directly at me. I could also tell that he was in a great deal of pain from the look in his eyes, and the grim facial expression he wore. I should have gone to the hospital. He wailed at me without breaking eye contact. I didn't understand what he meant by this, other than obviously he felt like he should have gone to the hospital. The statement and the desperation in his voice made me take a better look at him. He was very thin, much too thin to be remotely healthy. He was tall, lanky and bony, with long dark greasy hair that looked like it hadn't been washed in ages that fell past his shoulders, with sunken eyes with dark rings round them. It was a very sad sight. I was reminded of the friends around the way, constantly strung out, constantly depressed, losing weight and looking like, and feeling like crap. Bless them. He repeated his catchphrase, I should have gone to the hospital. And then with palms up, he stretched his arm out to me. Almost immediately, I began to understand. A large black abscess on each arm, where the arm bends on the opposite side of the elbow. It is a preferred place people stick themselves with their needles full of drugs. This was a phantom that had overdosed. He had shot up some drugs into his veins, probably missed a few times being so messed up, which caused abscesses on each arm. He'd most likely perished from the untreated wounds. That's why he kept repeating the bit about having gone to the hospital. When I woke up from the dream, I felt sort of sick. I felt sad, very sad. It felt so real, as if he'd been sitting there in the room chatting with me. I could not shake the dream from my mind. The look of the man, the sound of his voice, the sadness and the regret. 
I couldn't erase the image of his pleading eyes. Arms stretch out towards me, gigantic sores larger than 50 cent pieces on each arm and black as night. The experience left me with a very ghostly feeling. I was so affected by the dream of the dead man that later that day, when I was visiting one of the residents who had been living in the area for two decades, I couldn't help but mention it. Barb and I were good friends. She had become something like a mother to me. If I ever needed anything, she had it. It was mine without question, and that went both ways. Lovingly, I came to call her Ma, as many of those who she cared for did. We developed an unbreakable bond during those times and still share it to this day. I was sitting on her couch telling her about the dream, when halfway through it her demeanour changed slightly, and I saw her go sort of stiff. By the end of me explaining the dream her face had gone white, and a few beads of sweat had popped up on her forehead. I told her that it had felt so real that I couldn't get past the feeling of it actually being real, as if it had happened, as if I had actually held a conversation with this man. Taking a long draw on her cigarette, eyes larger than normal behind her glasses, she looked me straight in the face and went to tell me it was more than likely to be real. A man named Marty had lived in one or more of the apartments on the block before he had passed away, not before I moved into the area. She told me that I had described the way he looked during his final months perfectly, minus the gigantic black sores on the crooks of his arms. I could barely believe what she told me. Marty had laid in the apartment for three days before his body was found. He had indeed overdosed and was found with a needle beside him. I was simply stunned at the news. She also let me know that he had not been a bad man, but that he had merely lost his way to drugs. A story that practically the entirety of Eastern Tennessee is familiar with, due to the high volume of drug use in the region ever since the collapse of the coal industry and the good old American farm culture drying up. She went on to tell me that his daughter Katie and most of his friends had abandoned him due to his drug fueled downward spiral months before he perished. That is when I realised that I actually knew Katie, a chipper 18-year-old girl I had worked with only a few weeks ago at the pizza place in town where I had been the manager. She had even mentioned being distanced from her drug-using father shortly before his death, and I recalled making the connection. I was sort of shocked at the coincidence, and then began to think that it was perhaps no coincidence after all. I think Marty may have somehow felt his daughter's energy through me, or for some other unknown reason believed. I may have helped him move on, perhaps. Mar and I discussed this, and I decided to try something I had only dabbed with a few times. I would perform some recording attempting to contact Marty, and play back the footage in the hopes of discovering some EVP. I returned to my apartment, and using my cell phone for a recording device, I walked around lighting candles in each room and burning incense. I turned on several electronics, including lights, space heaters, and a TV, and did this in the hopes of providing a bit of energy that a ghost may be able to use in order to charge. I remember hearing that spirits could possibly manifest with the help of excess electricity. I stood in the center of the largest room in the house, which was the living room, and began to question thin air. Is there anyone here? Do any spirits want to show themselves? Walking from room to room, stopping near some electronics or under lights, I repeated the questions and phrases. I finished up my attempts to capture some sort of EVP with a heavy heart. I hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary the entire time, and haven't heard anything that sounded like a reply. No bumps, kicks or anything. To my not-so-great surprise, as I listened back over the recording of my inquiry, my ears picked up nothing but the soft white noise of static. After about 15 or 16 minutes into it, I heard a voice that was clear as a bell utter a single word. Marty. As I played the EVP for several people who had no idea about my dream or my interest in Marty, each one of them heard the same voice say the same thing. Marty. After playing the recording for several people, all of which confirmed what I believed I heard, I was left with absolutely zero doubt that he was indeed trapped in my apartment. So shortly after capturing the EVP and discussing the situation further with Ma, who had personally known him, 
I decided to perform a ritual of sorts to help him move on. Whether or not my attempts to help him accept his fate and forgive himself in order to move on were a success or not, I can't say for sure. But I never heard from him or dreamed of him again. And I also noticed soon after that part of the overwhelming depression I associated with the neighborhood was gone too. My next story. In the summer of 2008, several years before encountering the ghost of Marty, I had found myself and several companions in East Tennessee, renting an apartment on the third floor of a building on the town's old main street. The building we were in had been the original general store of the town in the 1800s. It was an interesting area of the town, if you're into history. Within two or three blocks from the apartment, there must have been more than half a dozen antique shops and buildings that had long since become antiques themselves. I was working as a manager at a local restaurant and was gone a lot of the time. My best friend, Sean, worked with me and was gone a lot of the time as well. Our other two roommates at the time were in between jobs and so spent a great deal more time alone in the apartment. They would tell Sean and I strange stories about the apartment that I didn't know if either one of us believed at first. They would say things like how they had heard the front door open and close by itself when it had been locked with a key and deadbolt. They said they would hear footsteps from the front door leading to the bathroom, or from the bathroom to one of the bedrooms. Supposedly, they would even hear voices as well. Twice they told us that they had been in the bathroom and heard the front door unlock and open and then close, footsteps approaching the bathroom, and then actually had a conversation with one of us through the door, thinking that we had come back home early. And then supposedly, when they came out of the bathroom, no one would be there, and the door to the apartment would still be locked. I believed something was happening, but didn't quite believe the stories about them, talking to someone or something through the bathroom door, or bedroom door, after hearing it unlock the front door lock and deadbolt and just waltz right into our apartment like it lived there. Well, like it was me. Sean was a skeptic too. At this point, he did not particularly care for either of our or other two roommates past the basic level of mutual respect, but put up with it for my sake. Needless to say, he was not putting much stock into what they were saying. One day, I was off work with Jess while Sean and the other roommates were at work and had walked across town for one reason or another. We had locked the door when we left and it was locked when we returned, but the living room was completely discombobulated. Books and papers on the floor, other items knocked on their sides or laying at odd angles. And yet, other things had definitely been rearranged with what appeared to be great care. The oddest thing to me was that the couch cushions were all standing slash leaning together in a strange manner, stacked in the shape of a W. The coffee table and another piece of furniture were also moved but showed no signs of damage. No one else had a key to the apartment at the time, including Sean and the other roommate. I was the only one who had the key and I had locked the door for sure. Shortly after the couch cushion incident, I was at the local library on a day off, again with Jess. After browsing around a bit and picking up a few books, we headed to the front desk to check them out. I don't recall exactly how the conversation came up, but Jess and the somewhat elderly librarian began discussing our apartment. She said she knew where it was because her niece had lived there, but had moved out because she believed it to be haunted. That she would hear voices, footsteps, and had even come home to discover the couch cushions standing at weird angles and things in the living room rearranged. I couldn't believe it. She had just validated the experiences my roommates, as well as myself, had had. A month or two passed from the time of the library trip, and I was coming home from work late one night, around midnight, and was dead tired. I had walked from the store to get some fresh air and wake up a bit after my long shift. It was only a mile or so, but I was exhausted. I pulled open the front door of the building and started up the old steps to the third floor after fantasizing about sitting down and taking my shoes off and just relaxing. About halfway up the stairs though, a sinister feeling began creeping up my spine. Now, I am not afraid of the dark, but at that moment I wish the hallway had better light 
as the only illumination in the staircase was cast from a single light bulb at the opposite end of the hallway. I reached the third floor landing, and as soon as I did, something jumped out at me from the shadow, a black shadow in the shape of a full-grown man. In hindsight, if you placed a black silhouette like people used for landscaping in the corner there atop the stairs, it would have been of a comparable size and color to what I actually saw, I'm sure. The shadow thing wasted no time rushing towards me from within a dark little nook in front of the apartment number three, the first one at the top of the odd stairs. But by the time it should have ran into me though, it simply vanished right back into thin air. Jess had mentioned seeing a shadow man in that long dark hallway multiple times. I assumed in about a second that I had just encountered him. That said, I never saw it again and we ended up moving not very long after that too. So who knows what else I may have experienced given the time to do so. I have many other encounters with ghosts and spirits and such entities. Marty and the haunted apartment in the old general store in Tennessee are more than adequate examples of why I believe in ghosts. Let's see what you make of this next encounter though. The monster in Alice's bedroom. I spent the first part of 2016 at my parents' house in Kentucky, going to school. I was a student in South New Hampshire University. It was during this time that I had a couple of very strange experiences. One, including a possible poltergeist, or even some sort of alien presence. The other, involving the infamous Black Triangle. These two events happened within days of each other, and I have reason to believe that the two incidences are directly related, which is an interesting story in itself. The first of the two bizarre encounters occurred one day when my family and I agreed to switch up the sleeping arrangements in the house. I would be taking the first bedroom atop the stairs, which was my old bedroom. For the past four or five years, the bedroom had been occupied by Alice. There was nothing strange about the arrangement or any particular reason to expect the situation that would soon unfold. After unpacking a few things and setting up my computer, I piddled around the room for a few hours before deciding to call it a night. A few minutes later, as I relaxed in bed, I was violently rocked from my thoughts of school, of loved ones, and of the future, as one corner post after the other of the old wooden bed lifted up and slammed back down with enormous speed and force. For a moment I couldn't understand what was happening. I thought maybe it was an earthquake, even though they were unheard of in Kentucky, and nothing else seemed to be shaking or moving but me in the bed. The bed continued to buck up and down, throwing me in the air several times, and scaring the hell out of me, until it stopped a few seconds after it began. Although, if you ever experience something of that manner, you will more than likely agree that the seconds seems like minutes, as your brain races to connect some sane conclusion about what is actually happening. The entire experience was probably anywhere from three to five seconds. However, in that seemingly short amount of time, each of the bed's corner posts had come up and down at least a couple of dozen times each. You can imagine how fast and bumpy the ride was. To add to the strangeness of it all, the moment the bed stopped bouncing and tossing me around, the eyes landed on the closest door, which just had a crack in it. The closet door. The hair on my arms immediately raised, my skin pricked up, and I got goosebumps. I had closed that door just a few hours earlier, when I had finished unpacking my stuff. I distinctly remember pulling the door shut after placing a half-empty box on the shelf inside and turning the light off. How it had opened, and what that may indicate, I will never know. That said, I do know how unnerving the closet door being open was to me, considering the bed had just done the impossible. Who knows what else could be possible? The bogeyman in the closet? The monsters under the bed? To be fair, it had felt as if a giant hand gripped the bed and jolted it around as a toddler may do with the bed in a dollhouse. Perhaps monsters were real. At any rate, the experience did not end there. 
The next night, an equally odd and unnerving circumstance befell me, the whole again preparing for bed. This night, my second night in my old bedroom, I had been listening to something on YouTube and eyeballing the closet from time to time, which makes what happens even freakier. Eventually, as I felt as if I may be able to drift to sleep, which is not the easiest thing to do as I suffer from chronic pain, and removed my earbuds, wrapped them around my phone and set it to the side. After making sure the charger was connected properly, and I wouldn't wake up to a dead phone, I laid back in the bed, pulled the covers up to my chest, flexed my toes and prepared for a good night's sleep. No sooner did I finish stretching, did my body tense back up in shock and disbelief as the bed once again launched me into the air and back down. This time it wasn't the entire bed bouncing and shaking front to back and side to side though, but three extremely hard and forceful thumps against the wooden footboard just inches from my feet. The knocking was so powerful that it rattled the wooden bed frame, and I again came several inches up and off the mattress, like I had the night before, as the foot of the bed lifted a foot or more so from the floor and slammed down three times. I imagined an invisible giant standing at the end of my bed and a field goal kicking the footboard with every ounce of his strength that he could muster because that's genuinely how it felt. I also again felt the presence of some unseen force, be it entity, creature or otherwise. I am sure that I was not alone. Something had damn sure knocked the hell out of my bed two nights in a row. I'm positive there was something there. What it was, on the other hand, I will never know. Or want to know, for that matter. It wasn't until the next morning, after both occurrences had taken place, that I remembered Alice's regular complaints of scary monsters visiting her room at night and terrifying her. Her stories weren't mostly ignored, though, as I believed my mum more than likely knew deep down that there may have been some truth to it all, with something visiting her room in the dead of night, which happens to be one of my earliest memories, and is an eyebrow-raising encounter on its own, one that left my mum with a deep fear of alien-like beings to this very day. As far as Alice's monsters, I believe they were real, whether it was her monsters or not, something definitely wanted my attention when I took over her bedroom, and they got it. The experience I shared with Alice, whether it be monsters or otherwise, I can't really say. But what I can say is that it could have been caused by an angry spirit, maybe even a poltergeist. Who knows? Let me take you back 25 years to a deserted highway in the United States. I want to keep as much information as possible anonymous, but will tell you what I can. I worked a job that required me to travel from different states to check various facilities. I can't name what they were specifically. But a job like this does involve a lot of driving, and as such, it was one of my usual days driving to work. Today's assignment was taking me to Ohio. I was about four hours away, hadn't really driven this way before, or at least not in a long time, and I was just listening to the radio and chewing on a granola bar, waiting for the next gas station, as I really needed a leak. I had been busting for a while. And after a short time, did I find a run-down gas station in the middle of nowhere. Great. Just what I needed. The sky was already getting quite dark at this point, and the fluorescent neon lights shining above the pumps were all that illuminated this dingy little run-down spot in the middle of nowhere. I pulled up and took in the scenery, breathed a cold sigh, and went to fill up the car before relieving myself and getting my much needed snacks. I looked around, it was empty. There was not a single soul around, save for the cashier who I was assuming was probably in the back of the gas station. I see the gas meter fill up and when it's finally done, do I put the cork back in my car and walk over 
and into the gas station. I remember it like it was yesterday. It had some terrible band from that era playing on the radio, and I was just thinking to myself, they needed better taste in music. I didn't even look at the cashier first, so intent on finding the bathroom and collecting my snacks. The bathroom, as the sign said, was just on a little door to my left, so I busted through and made use of the facilities while I still had the chance. Once I was done, I walked out, and that's when I noticed a strange smell. It was a bit weird, I thought. Could it have been a cleaning product that they used? I made my way, grabbed some chips and a few other bits, and my mandatory Hershey's bar. That's when I made my way to the counter. I noticed the cashier was completely absent. <sighs> I didn't want to be late. I was already running a little bit late anyway, but thought if I sped, I could probably make it in time. But now the cashier was absent, and I was losing my patience. I placed my candy and snacks and drink on the counter and yelled, Hello, is anyone here? I tapped on the desk a few times after about a minute, but no one came. I was starting to get on my nerves. Surely someone was working here. How the hell was I supposed to pay for my gas? I waited about three more minutes, patiently waiting, sure that whoever was probably in the security building was about to come out. Maybe they were in the staff toilets, I don't know. I started perusing a magazine while waiting, really wasting my time and getting more and more annoyed. So I started to walk towards the staff only door, clearly labeled staff only, and decided to give it a little knock. I knocked the door, but there was no reply. This time, starting to get concerned, I started to push the door open, and that's when the smell hit me. It was a very peculiar smell, and as I pushed it open more and more, did I see the cashier lying in a pool of blood next to some crates. I instantly rushed to him and asked if he was okay. I wasn't sure if he was dead or not, and I started freaking out. So I grabbed my cell phone, but there was obviously no service here. Crap. I was sure that I had seen a phone outside the gas station, so I ran out and dialed 911. I told the police what happened, and they said that they were gonna send an ambulance, but that it would take at least 40 minutes to get there, as well as several cops. The cops arrived first. I think the kid was pretty much on his way out. I never found out if he made it or not. Either way, that was an interesting excuse for being late for work. I don't think I'll ever forget it. I managed to pay, the manager came in the end, and every time I passed that gas station in the future, I always asked myself if the kid had survived or not, but never had the balls to go in and check or ask. I thought it would be imprudent, let alone the fact that if he had survived, I doubt he'd have worked there anyway. But it always leaves me wondering, what the hell happened there? Maybe a robbery? Guess I'll never know. A few years back, I was driving on this back road between two or three a.m. after hanging out with a few friends. There was no one on the road, certainly no one walking, and it was incredibly foggy. The area here is a small protected wetland, and visibility was maybe 30 to 40 feet at best. There is a 90 degree turn. As I am turning, there's a man standing there, arms at his sides, wearing ragged clothes, just standing perfectly still, about two feet in the road. I nearly hit him, but was certainly closer to crapping my pants than anything else. I've shared this story enough times to appreciate that not everyone is going to believe me. But I'm leaving it here for all of you to see what you will make of it. Let me take you back to the 1990s. Me and my then girlfriend were traveling around Australia, trying to do the West Coast. It was one hell of a journey. We were driving a car that we had just bought a few weeks ago. Our goal was to try and go all around Australia. Now that we made it, 
we ran out of cash eventually. Not long after this story, in fact. But the story really begins in the middle of nowhere, roughly around 7 p.m. The sun was just about to set, and we were laughing and having a good time in the car. That's when I noticed that our gas was running slightly low. I knew a gas station was coming up from my map, and was excited about the prospect of getting a few drinks and a snack. It'd be a long drive still, maybe a long night until we got to our destination. The plan was that I was going to drive until about 10, swap, and then my girlfriend drive for a few hours, and just take turns that way so that we could reach it by that day. So we're driving, and the gas meter is going steadily south, and I see that we're going to run out of fuel any minute now. I swear the number was almost on zero, and I was starting to panic. That's when we see it in the distance, a gas station, poorly lit, but there it was, a beacon of neon glory shining out in all the gloom. As we slowly pull up, we see a gang of bikers not too far off. Now saying this place was dingy was an understatement. It looks like it had been built in the 50s and forgotten about until then. But nonetheless, we were desperate for gas. My girlfriend said to save time, she'd go in and grab the drinks while I could fill up the gas, and then we'd pay and go. So I started filling up. I'm there standing, just minding my own business, and I'm cautious about the bikers behind me. I try not to look at them. But just to make sure that one wasn't approaching me, I have a quick look around, make it casual and nonchalant. I look all around in every direction, just make sure they are where they are, and to my surprise, they start flying off, just driving away. Great, I thought. Just me and my girlfriend at the gas station. Now I don't have to worry about getting mugged or something. Not that I have a problem with bikers, but we had been mugged a few days earlier. So, you know, it was on my mind. My girlfriend comes back a few minutes later, says she's paid and we're about ready to leave. But then she blurts out that she has to pee. So there I go, waiting in the car for her to pee. She goes to the restroom, and I'm waiting for about five minutes, getting bored, tapping my thumbs on the dashboard. I'm thinking, what the hell? Why is it taking so long? Maybe the peep turned to a poop. Ten minutes later, I'm really bored now. Remember that we really wanted to make it to our next destination by morning, and these small time wastes were really getting on my nerves. So I close the car door and don't lock it because there's no one around and we are in the middle of nowhere, and start making my way towards the shack where my girlfriend was allegedly peeing. I call out to my girlfriend, Sharon, you okay, honey? I get no reply. I start to get concerned. Did something happen? Now, these stalls were literally just like saloon doors, and... I could easily just look over the top if I jumped. Knowing that there was no one there and I wouldn't be disrespecting anyone else's privacy, I quickly did a little jump to see if she was on the stall. And she wasn't. That was the designated female restroom. Finding it a bit weird that she wouldn't hear me or reply, I jumped up at the male restroom and she was gone. Then a thought crossed my mind. Did the bikers take my girlfriend? I just about crapped myself, thinking that's maybe why they went off in a hurry. No, it couldn't be. She came back after they'd left, I told myself, but I was starting to doubt. What the hell was going on here? I busted the door open, and she wasn't in either of them. They weren't locked. I walked all around the small shack, and she wasn't behind it either. It was dark by now, and I couldn't see into the vast expanse of emptiness surrounding us. So I called out, Sharon? Honey? Of course, I was met with pure silence. So I walk around the convenience store part, shouting and seeing if she's there, when my last thought is that maybe there's an additional restroom within there. So I calm down a little bit, open the door, and go speak to the cashier, and ask, 
if there was a restroom inside. He gives me a brief nod to where I had just come from, the restrooms outside, and I explained that my girlfriend had just come in here and bought some stuff and paid for the gas. Where was she? The guy shrugged his shoulders. He couldn't have cared less. I asked if there was a toilet in here and he said there was, but it was staff only. Thinking to myself that maybe she just ignored the sign, I walked up to the staff only restroom and just knocked on the door. Sharon, are you okay? There was no reply. That's when I looked down at the handle. It was green, meaning not locked. I pulled down the handle slowly, but she wasn't inside. At this point, I was really starting to get concerned. I didn't have a phone back then. I mean, they were rare and I thought I needed to call the cops. I didn't know what to do. Was she playing a prank on me? So I looked underneath the car and looked everywhere I thought she could possibly be. And by this point, I was freaking out. So I asked the guy if there was a payphone and there wasn't. He told me that if I wanted a phone, I'd have to drive to the nearest town a good 20 minutes away. Crap, I thought. But what if Sharon comes back? I, I don't even know where she's gone. If the toilets were so dirty, I mean, would she really have traveled all the way in the darkness to a field to pee or something? My mind was losing it with concern. I was genuinely getting scared. But thinking that I didn't have another choice, after about 20 minutes of waiting, I jumped on my car and started the drive. I drove for about five minutes before I saw Sharon on the road. I pulled over immediately and shouted to her, asking her what the hell she was doing. She gave me the most funny look and said, you're not going to believe me if I told you. She said that she was peeing in the little stall and came out. But when she left the stall, there was nothing there. No gas station, no anything. Most of all, I was gone in the car. She had a panic attack, started crying, and said she fell to her knees in despair, so confused as to what happened and just began walking along the road, always looking back to see if I were coming. By this point, it had been nearly 40 minutes, and she had been walking a fair distance, and I could see the tears in her eyes and how the mascara had run down her face. I was feeling a deep knot in the pit of my stomach. I didn't really know what to say. I asked if she was feeling all right and maybe if the heat was getting to her, but she said that she was fine. She said, what happened? And I couldn't offer an explanation, but did say, let's drive back so that we can see the gas station and maybe get you properly hydrated. It was only at that point that I noticed that she hadn't gotten snacks and drinks. And this time we see the gas station, but not like we saw it before. It was run down. The store had been completely deserted. The shacks, non-existent. What the hell was going on here? Were we in some weird time slip? I honestly don't know what to say. I really don't. I've got no words. I have no idea what was going on. But only me and Sharon truly believe the story as we're the ones who experienced it. We broke up a few months after for unrelated reasons, but keep in touch via Facebook. And the only time I ever brought up the story, she corroborated everything exactly as I remembered it. My dad had this habit of knocking his fingers on the wall in our hallway as he walked by, and he had a crackly toe. Together it made a very distinctive sound. We always knew when we were in trouble by the tempo of that sound. My older brother had a kid a few years after my dad died one night. While I'm babysitting, and the kid upstairs is in her crib about 18 months, over the monitor. I can tell she's not napping anymore, but she seems to be occupying herself. Then I hear that noise that my dad used to make, and she giggles. It took me a minute to recognize that sound, but when I did, I went upstairs. The door to her room had been closed when I put her down, but now it was open and she was standing at her crib 
looking at the far corner, but there was nothing there. I live in a city known, sadly, for its crime rate, even though it's an awesome place to be. My street has a lot of variety in race and income level, and generally the vibe is live and let live. We all know each other from sight. One evening I was walking to the top of my street to get something from the gas station on the corner. I leave my driveway, and as I do so I see a pretty rough looking guy on the other side of the street, walking the same way I'll be, more or less directly across from me. The apartments across from me are rougher too, except when he sees me, I can tell he's thinking about something, like he sees me, and then he's considering something. I see him look both ways and I hear him jaywalk to my side of the street. I've already turned at this point. He reaches my side and I hear him about 10 feet away say, Hey man, what's up? I glance back and say, Hey dude, and pick up my pace. He's walking fairly quick too, and heavily. I really pour on the walking speed and eventually I don't hear his footsteps anymore. I think he must have fallen back or turned off the road. There are two paths to the gas station from my street. You can walk down the sidewalk nearly to the intersection and then go through the parking lot. Or you can leave the sidewalk a bit earlier for a dirt path that's quicker and takes you right along the back and side of the gas station to the front. I go for the sidewalk, don't hear the guy and don't see him as I turn into the lot. He pops up right behind me from the dirt path. I'm in near panic mode. The entrance to the gas station is 10 feet away and I dart inside. I turn around to face this guy. I figure the cameras are right here on the inside entrance and his face will be on them at this angle. There were two attendants right there. I'm gonna just make myself big and go really loud. What are you doing here, man? As I open my mouth to say it, the guy power walks past me. A look of total surprise on his face and goes, wait, you really had to piss too? and blows past me straight to the bathrooms, wafting the booze smell on him into my nostrils. The guy was hammered. He'd been trying to cross the street for a while already. The mental math I watched him do before crossing was, oh man, this dude's gonna think I'm gonna try and jump in. What can I do? I know, I'll say something when I'm behind him so he knows I'm not sneaking up on him. And he was probably relieved when he took the dirt path and I didn't, thinking he wouldn't run into me again. I was doing a road trip with a friend of mine when we arrived to a town that just felt off, almost like the writers of Twin Peaks had shown up and decided to take the inspiration for their show. Anyway, we stopped there for an emergency bathroom break. We were both naive city dwelling 18 year old girls. The porta potty off the freeway near some dilapidated buildings was too gross to use, so we drove up ways to the main street. The only thing open at 2 p.m. on a Thursday was a craft shop, which my friend rushed into while I waited in the car. When a giant bald man with a crazed look in his eye came barreling out of nowhere and started slapping the side of our little Fiat, yelling at me that I was too pretty not to smile. I tried texting my friend to warn her but had no service. He circled the car a few times acting mean and drunk, shaking the entire vehicle and was close to breaking a window. I'm no stranger to crackheads fried out on their mind, but this felt different. He seemed to have given up and walked a few steps away. My friend came out, noticed the look on my face, and we peeled out of there. And he chased our car for a lot longer than expected. Once I had cell service again, I looked up the town, and at the time I believe it was almost 25% felons, with a population of 300. I bought a new car several months ago and had to drive the 395 from Reno to Vegas to get it. Damn lack of dealerships in northern Nevada. The trip down was fine, but going back north was later in the day when we left and it was dark by the time we got to Walker Lake Reservation. Late summer, pitch black at about 10 p.m. and little do we know that the lake is known for midge swarms. I thought it started sprinkling rain as we rounded the bend, but soon started pumping my windshield wash as fast as I could 
as my windshield was plastered with thousands of midges in a gigantic swarm over the road. I slowed to 40 to 20 as visibility was poor at best for a good two mile stretch of seemingly endless bug apocalypse. I ran out of windshield wiper fluid near the end and had to drive 15 miles to the next town barely able to see. I had my sister-in-law with me and I'm fairly certain it was the scariest moment of both of our lives to date. Don't go to Walker Lake in summer after dark. The place apparently gets spiders so bad in the summer, bushes look like wads of webbing. Also so much for my new car being detailed. I'm fairly certain the garage still stinks of bug after that much power washing and there's still guts hidden in every crevice of that car. This happened a while back. I had just obtained a new car and was visiting family in Lower Alabama. I decide to go for a late night joyride and everything's fine until I end up in some heavily wooded deep back roads. This super thick fog starts moving in, so thick that I can no longer confidently drive faster than 10 to 15 miles per hour and I had to turn my headlights off and rely on fog lights. I decide I need to pull over and use Google Maps to find directions back, since I couldn't even read street signs through the fog. I find an opening in the trees besides the road and pull over. No cell service. I sit for a minute and try to see if I can remember all my turns to get back. As I'm sitting there, the fog starts to clear ever so slightly, and I see that I am parked by a church that could be as old as 200 years, and I'm parked nearly atop of the cemetery. This is the part where if this were a horror movie, I'd go into the church and see if there's someone to give me directions. Nope. I just turned around and left immediately, and eventually found my way back. Nothing paranormal happened, but I was about 95% certain something paranormal was about to. To be honest, a part of me wished I checked out that church. There's an extreme curiosity. Everything seemed to lead me there and present the church to me. Maybe a ghost needed my help. My oldest could talk before she could walk. As a toddler, she always got excited when we invited people over for a party. One particular 4th of July gathering, when her godfather made his usual appearance, she was so excited to see him that she ran to him yelling, Uncle Tony, Uncle Tony! Her loud screeches of delight caught my attention, but I wondered who she was yelling for. I saw my brother-in-law scoop her up in his arms and saw the whole exchange. But who was Uncle Tony? When I caught my husband's attention, I asked, Who's Uncle Tony? He answered in a flat tone. Chucky. I must have had quite a confused look on my face because he quickly explained that his brother, who we've always called Chucky, Rachel's uncle, who was holding her now, had the name the family never used. His name is Anthony, he said, and was named after his own father. He's the only one who called him Tony. Now at this point I had known my brother-in-law for more than 10 years. I even worked with him a few years in the same office and never once heard Chucky called Anthony, or Tony for that matter. I walked over to Rachel and Chucky and asked if he had told her his real name. He answered, no, why would I? To this day, she still calls him Uncle Tony. She's the only one in the family that does. Her grandfather must have told her this well-kept family secret. After all, he was the one who had given his first son his name. But there's just one problem with this idea. Grandad has been dead for over 40 years. The rabbits near where I live all get something that we call mixy or myxomatosis. It's where they go deaf and blind and just wander onto the roads to promptly get killed. We did a sponsored walk with my school at the time and it happened. We all walked along this long road that was stained red with blood for miles and strewn with literally hundreds, maybe thousands of pulverized rabbits. Nobody said a word the entire time and all that you could hear were the sobs of younger kids. Except for that one moment where it turned to them shrieking. Two live infected rabbits had basically exploded under a passing car. 
It was pretty bleak and yet memorable stuff. Sometime during late autumn, a long time ago, my dad's body was driving to work early in the morning. It was very early and almost pitch black. He drove through a small forest as usual. When he turned a corner, he saw a corpse hanging off a tree right above the road. Some guy decided to off himself and this poor factory worker was the one who found him first, alone in the dark, hanging one to two meters off the ground, illuminated only by the headlights of the car. Needless to say, he called the cops and went home ASAP. He had to go to therapy to overcome how traumatic that event was. In South Africa, we have a lot of hijacking, and for a while, the favoured method to stop cars was to play dead in the road. Of course, it doesn't take long for people to figure out that stopping to help people on the road is a bad idea. And that is where my friend of a friend joins the story. On his way home from work one night, he lived on a small holding. He sees a body in the road about one kilometre from his house. He quickly realised what was up and decided to just drive up onto the pavement and go around the body without stopping. He got home about two minutes later, ran inside and called the police when he saw them coming down the road. He returned to where he had seen the body to tell them where they start their search. Obviously there was no body, but what they did find was quite surprising. Three dead hijackers hiding in the long grass on the curb. As it turns out, when he had driven up on the curb to avoid the dead guy, he had crushed all of the accomplices. The quote-unquote dead guy was never found, as far as I know. This happened to my girlfriend last night. We had been camping for four days and were leaving on the fifth, but my girlfriend had to leave the night before because of work. I told her to drive safe because I was pretty worried about her hitting a deer. She drives a little Volkswagen bug, so I knew if she'd hit something, it wouldn't go over too well. Around 45 minutes later, she shot me a call and told me about something that happened to her while she was driving. She was driving down a straight stretch of road with no side roads going off it, just forest. While she was driving, she saw headlights pop up behind her, which was odd enough since there were no roads for it to turn off of. Even more odd, the headlights drove up to 60 miles an hour and caught her in around four seconds. She said she was listening to a song that had a countdown, so that's how she could tell. Now she was a little sketched out, so she sped up a bit, but it kept following. The headlights pulled up next to her, but she said she didn't see a car but a silhouette of someone running. She slammed on her brakes and went down to around 20, where the headlights followed the road for a bit before veering off the road into the forest. When she sped back up to that part of the woods, she didn't see any light or anything. Now this really freaked her out, to the point she wanted to stop talking about it, but said her dad had experienced something similar and said it could be a skimwalker. I've never really believed in that kind of thing, so, what could explain her experience? And if it could have been something like a skinwalker or a spirit, why did it pretend to be a car? <laughs> 